Okay, we are now live. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Stratton. I am the chair of the multi city of Asheville. Um, today's meeting is held today on October 28th, 2020. The MMTC exists to assist the city in furthering, uh, advancing, and promoting a comprehensive and integrated transportation system that incorporates multimodal concepts, including but not limited to transit, bicycle and pedestrian facilities, greenways, complete streets, and highways. All commission members and staff are participating virtually. We appreciate your patience as we work through the commission meeting a bit differently uh, as we're now virtual. Uh, we are streaming live on our virtual engagement hub, which can be accessed through the virtual engagement hub link on the front page of the city website. It can also be found on the commission webpage. In addition, there is an option to uh, for the public to listen live by phone by dialing the number 855-925-2801. Again, that's 855-925-2801 and entering the code number 9466. Again, that's 9466. Uh, for all of those that uh, are out there and joining us today, we'd like to welcome you all. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna begin by starting off the meeting by a call to order and we'll do a roll call. Uh, I'll go through and introduce all the commission members who are participating virtually. Please make sure to mute your microphone if you are not speaking. Uh, when you have a question or would like to speak, uh, please unmute, unmute your microphone. Also, please remember to mute your phone after um, your, uh, your microphone uh, when you're done spe speaking. Uh, commission members, as I call your name, please say a uh, quick hello and um, what interests you represent. So I'm going to start with um, Vice Chair Randy Warren. Yeah, I'm Randy Warren, and I'm on, also on the bike bed task force. Good to see you, Randy. Um, next, we've got uh, Anna Sexton. Hi, I'm Anna Sexton. I represent the Neighborhood Advisory Committee on the Multimodal Transportation Commission. Uh, next up, um, we've got Rich Lee. Is Rich with us today? Okay, so I, I think Rich is not with us. Uh, also, I know um, not in attendance uh, is Kim Roney, as well as um, Joe Archibald. I think he might be joining us a little bit later, though. Um, next up, uh, Kenny Armstrong. Hey, I'm here. Um, I represent the Greenway Committee as well. Awesome. I'm glad you could join us. Dennis Winsel. Hey everybody, um, my name is Dennis Wenzel and I'm on the Greenway Committee as well. Very good, thanks Dennis. Um, next up we've got Patricia Katz. Hi everybody, I'm a general um, member. I was a transportation committee member uh, coordinator in Atlanta, Georgia for uh, six years back in the 90s and I have a lot of like construction experience. And my husband is a huge bicycle rider. Awesome, thanks Patricia, we're glad to have you today. Um, and I think uh, that does it as far as roll call is concerned. So let's get started um, with new business. Um, today uh, we are actually gonna be um, replacing a couple members. Actually, we have three seats that need to be replaced and we have got uh, applications that uh, should have been sent. Jimmy, Michael, my, sorry, I think we just need to- um, Now to our members, the, uh, making okay. recommendations. We need to approve uh, the agenda in minutes and then- oh, There you go. Public comment. So. Very good. Um, so let's, let's, uh, let's absolutely do that first. So let's um, review the minutes. Um, do I have a motion to approve the, the minutes from the last meeting? Um, hey, Mike, it's Dennis. I move that we approve the minutes as submitted. Do I have a second? A second. Uh, okay, so I've got a, a motion from Dennis Winsel and a second from Patricia Katz. 
Uh, we're going to have to do a roll call uh, vote um, as this is a virtual meeting. So we'll go through now uh, with all those that are in attendance. Um, the motion is to approve the minutes meeting. Uh, we'll start with uh, Randy Warren. Aye. Okay. Um, next up, we've got uh, Kenny Armstrong. Aye. Very good. Uh, very, uh, next up, we've got Dennis Wenzel. I can't get Aye. the Google meeting to go back to where I can see everybody. Um, next up, we've got uh, Patricia Katz. Can you can you hear us, Patricia? Yes, I can. I agree. Okay. Um, this is a, a non-voting member, but uh, I just want to make that known as as to as to that fact. Uh, so uh, looks like the, the yeas have it, and the minutes have been approved. Let's see. Uh, and then. I'd also like to um, give a motion to approve the agenda for today's meeting. Do I have a motion for that? I move to approve the agenda for today's meeting. I second it. It's a great agenda. Okay. Uh, sounds like we've got a, a motion from uh, Kenny. I believe that was motion. And then we've got a second from uh, Dennis Wenzel on that. Uh, so we'll, the do that we'll go through uh, the other way around. Uh, okay, so we're going to um, do another roll call on that. We'll go with uh, with Randy Warren. Hi. Okay. Um, Kenny Armstrong. Yep. Okay. Um, Dennis Wenzel. Hi. And Patricia Katz. Hi. Yes. The motion to approve the agenda is passed. Um, so now let's move on to the business. Um, the first item on our agenda today um, is to um, fill the vacancies that we have. Um, again, we're not actually filling these vacancies, but we're going to making our recommendation uh, to city council uh, on the um, applicants that, uh, that that we'd like to, to move forward on, on these three. Uh, the three seats that are currently um, that will be uh, vacant are Rich Lee's seat, Kim Roney's seat, and Dave Nutt. Uh, so Rich and Kim are holding on and uh, hold it, holdovers until uh, we find uh, their, their replacements. Dave is no longer with us. Um, so we should have an attachment. Um, does every, has everybody had an opportunity to, to take a look at the applicants and the attachment? Just yes or no? Okay. Yeah. I'd like to open up this this up to, to, to comment uh, within um, our um, our group. Um, so if anybody has got any any comments, let's 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 get started. Dennis, I see, I see you've got. Hey, Michael. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was uh, impressed with uh, so many folks. It seems like we have a really good uh, a lot of interest, and I think that's great. Um, I found that there was people that had a, a variety of different uh, experiences. I think it's important to kind of flesh out our team um, and to have folks that are bringing things that are um, a little bit different. I was, you know, really impressed by everybody. Um, in particular, I felt like uh, Mr. Basson, uh, Mr. Bueller, and, uh, Ms. Bueller and Mr. Waddle were the ones that I felt like could really do a good job of, uh, of filling in some spaces that maybe some of the holes that we have within our team. I'll have to concur with that. Well, um, very, very much so. Um, do we have any other, any, any other chance? I think we, we did have some straw at, uh, in particular, um, you know, I noticed that Mr. Um, Bassoon, um, and, and again, if I've butchered these names, I'm sorry. I haven't had an opportunity to speak with these folks yet. Um, but uh, I, I thought Mr. Bassoon was uh, was great because uh, he's got restaurant experience, and you know, as far as transportation is concerned, we have a lot of folks in this community that are to get to work that work in the restaurant industry. So somebody that has that understanding, I think, it could be a value. Um, as far as um, uh, Mr. Waddell, Michael Waddell, um, I thought. Um, 
well, he's worked in uh, community organizing in particular around uh, uh, getting getting folks um, uh, connected with food nutrition across uh, communities. So I thought that was really important too. It seems like there's some community organizing aspects that, that really became a strong advocate, um, candidate as well. Uh, and then uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Bayer, or, or I want to go with uh, Lydia. Um, she's a, a licensed engineer and has spent uh, 11 years uh, working uh, with uh, as a transportation engineer. So obviously that could be of, 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 of huge value too. Um, but again, I'm, I'm interested to know what the rest of the team thinks. Just, just to be clear, I think we're, are we filling four? Well, we have four openings, right? Correct, that's what the document says. The, the um, document we have on this, I think, so there's uh, Kim's old seat, Dave Nutter's old seat, uh, Beth's old seat, and then Rich's old seat too. So we actually have four openings, correct? I've got three according to the agenda. Who, uh, well, that's my understanding. Um, Kim, Dave, and Rich. Uh, well, on the document that was included with the materials received, it shows Kim, Dave, uh, Elizabeth's seat still too, and Rich's seat. Hmm. Yeah, that does make sense actually, because Elizabeth's no longer with us. She's moved, uh, unfortunately, down to South Carolina. Um, unfortunate for us. Mm -hmm. Dennis, that's just did, Dennis, yep. did Dennis replace John Riddout? I think so. That, I mean, that, that sounds accurate, but there's been a lot of flux here. So if, if I'd, I'd be interested to know what our documentation says. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, love if we have this on the uh, agenda, chances are that we're going to have to kind of follow our agenda. And then maybe what we'll have to do is the next meeting, we can bring in that fourth person if that's the situation where we need to fill that gap. Yeah, except for this information was included with the agenda. So this shows four openings. Um, yeah, it could be that I made a mistake. Um, it's very possible. Um, so if you want to propose for and perhaps rank them um and the if if we learn that the fourth is um not actually an open seat then we could just take the top three to the council do that or we don't have to fill all, all four seats if there are four too we can fill three seats and then if we have to fill the fourth one we could do it next meeting correct yeah, I I like what Dennis suggested since it does say explicitly in the agenda to fill three seats, we can go ahead and make recommendations to do that today and then kind of take a an official tally. Um and if if there's still a need for next meeting, we can do that. Might it also be a good idea to reach back out to Sandy and John since they applied in March? March seems like a long time ago. We might want to reach back out and see if they're still interested. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, that sounds good. I, I, I tend to agree with Dennis as well. And that gives um, a little bit more opportunity for us to keep the, keep the um, uh, advertisement going. Um, if, if in fact, there's some, some other folks out there that uh, I may, if, if, am I right in that, uh, Jessica, is that what would happen or would, would, would the advertisement be closed and we're just going back to, to look to who's, who's looked into this in the past um, uh no we we keep them open it's really just uh right. an, a rolling rolling um application people can apply whenever they whenever they want and and i believe that um within the last couple months we did reach out to everybody that had submitted an application and i believe that sandy and john did indicate that they were still interested um, I could be incorrect on that, but I'm pretty sure that everybody that had submitted did respond to us. And, um, and I do know of one other individual who's interested and, and there was a miscommunication about 
his application. Um, so there, there would be at least one more in the, in the stack for review if you want to uh, wait to fill a fourth seat. And that, you know, and just reviewing this again, I do, it does appear that I made a mistake in thinking that there was only three. Um, it, well, it, it you know, I think that's a good thing. Uh, just uh, again, referring to the person that you're you're speaking of, um, this individual Ooh. would apply to, to Greenways, and I do I do know who you're talking about on that one. Um, and he had he had uh, inquired and wanted to, to be part of this, but because of technicalities, we weren't able to make that work. So. Um, yeah, I think I think it's a it's a good mistake to have. Maybe perhaps let's just move forward with, with uh, uh, recommending three today, um, and then we'll work on that that uh, that next one on the next meeting. Does that sound good to everybody? Or do we need to take a vote on this? I don't think so. I don't think you need to take a vote on to hold one yeah. opening for the next meeting. All right, so let's uh, let's just agree to that um, verbally, and we'll um, we'll move forward with the three recommendations. So, uh, do we have a motion on on any uh, particular individual, or do we want to continue the discussion? Um, do we have any strong feelings? Hey, Michael, I can make a motion for Mr. Uh, to recommend uh, to fill our three three of our vacancies with Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Waddell you and Bueller. That one more time because you broke up a little bit. I don't know if that was on my end or, or yours. Um, I'd like to move that we uh, recommend for three vacancies, uh, Mr. Basun. I keep on destroying these names. Uh, Ms. Bueller and Mr. Waddell. I'll second those recommendations. Okay, so uh, Dennis has made a motion that we Mr. Uh, Michael Waddell and uh, Ms. Lydia uh, uh, Bauer, uh, and we've got a second from Randy. So we're going to proceed with a roll call uh, vote to amend these three applicants on to the full city council. So we'll go um, get this started with uh, Randy Warren. Uh, aye. Okay. Um, got. Uh, uh, Kenny Armstrong. Aye. We've got uh, Dennis uh, Wenzel. Aye. Okay. Patricia Katz. Agreed. Uh, and myself, Michael Stratton. Uh, I'm so moved. So uh, the motion to send these three applicants. Uh, John Bassoon, Michael Waddell, and Ms. Lydia uh, Bauer on the city council has been uh, approved. Excellent. That's great. This is what was really needed. We, we've been lacking with, uh, with with some of this um, this flux in our, our group. So I'm looking forward to uh, uh, to to moving on and having a, a full uh, roster on this. Um, okay. So next up um, on the agenda is going to be the right of way. Closures. Uh, we've got a series of these, so we're gonna um, we're gonna try to get through these as quickly as possible. But these are important, so we're gonna we're gonna take a take a listen, let staff um, go through the presentation. The first one that we're gonna be looking at uh, is the right of way closure for 55 South Market Street um, slash uh, Velvet Street. Hi. Um, so in your attached staff report, there are a number of documents that you should be able to open, including the staff report from the technical review committee, the applicant's petition, a map showing the area, and, um, and some additional correspondence that has taken place about this project. And um, basically what we're looking at is uh, what I would consider to be kind of a double-sided mistake, um, unintended mistake on both the city's part and perhaps the applicant's part. Um, the issue is that the um, there is a stairwell that was an outside exterior stairwell that was constructed that happened to be constructed within existing right-of-way. 
And um, so, and this was constructed, I believe, because the fire department had required that there be an additional um, fire safety access or, or um, um, means of egress. And so um, for all intents and purposes, this, this stairway in the right of way, it does not cause any practical um, issue in terms of the, the operation of the adjacent, adjacent property. Um, and so the city staff has reviewed it um, and, and recommends it for approval. Um, we don't want to and can't have the stairwell removed. And so um, we are recommending that this kind of be retroactively approved as a partial small piece of right of way closure. And I believe we may have the applicant on the on the meeting. And if there's any questions, um, they may be able to provide some information. Um, this is Greg Hoffman with Civil Design Concepts. The applicant's on the meeting as well, but um, I'm, I'm a civil engineer for the project and can answer any questions. Um, and um, yeah, that, that description was was you know very accurate. I can add some more information if asked. Um, um, but the, the one thing I would correct is that it, it wouldn't be a, a portion of the, the right of way would be relocated at the intersection um, with Beaumont um, to, at, at city at city staff um, request or direction. So it wouldn't be a, a true abandonment of a portion. It would be a relocation to maintain the, the current width. Well, thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, that, that, that is helpful for sure because. Sorry, go ahead, Randy. Well, I was that's helpful for sure, but um, it, it does seem like in, in reading over the staff notes, they're basically saying that there was a mistake was made in terms of the way the building was built. And so basically um, it seems like they're saying, hey, we made this mistake. Oh, it, well, you know, and so just, you know, um, we're asking for an oops on this. And I guess the thing we have to be careful of is that people intentionally building things out in the right of ways and then later on asking for permission. So I don't know if that's the case with this one. It doesn't seem like it was. But if we if, if we establish though that we're just gonna approve anything that when people make mistakes, we just need to be very careful about setting that precedent though, because then people we know people, people will do that on purpose. They will start taking over right of ways and then say, Well, the city can, you know, what was requested. Uh, approval, pay the twenty five hundred dollars, and we'll get it later on too, which isn't a good way to operate business. So I just think that we need to be aware of of that possibility. It, that wasn't the case um, with this project. There's uh, towards the end of the pro of construction, um, it was we we were made aware there was an error with this the stairs. They they couldn't fit in the space provided. They needed to have more, uh, basically, an additional flight of stairs. And um, we submitted revised plans. Uh, the architect did, and they asked for our, um, for our help with coordinating the grading where it connects to the sidewalk. We submitted revised plans to the city through the TRC portal, um, and they, they were approved. Uh, the, the stairs were built in, in accordance with those plans, and TCOs were issued. Um, and then this this issue with the right of way encroachment, um, you know, we we I became aware of it in in the spring. Um, the the city. Uh, attorney's office and the applicant were having um, some other discussions over the winter. I'm not exactly sure when they became aware of it, but it was so sometime after that point where TCOs were issued and, and a CO was applied for. Um, but it, but this wasn't intentional, and you know we were um, you know made every attempt to be transparent um, with the entire process, submitting plans, revised plans through the the city's portal um, for review by different departments. And, uh, I, and I appreciate that the, the right way is being relocated rather than closed, too. So I, I think it's helpful. Yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, this, uh, I was curious, could we get some clarification what, what the relocation uh, means? So there are some stairs. When I you know, was kind of walking around that area, I could see that the stairs are clearly in that path. Is there going to be then access that we, if we, you know, if at some point in the future we wanted to put some type of multi-use path through there that cuts out to the back of the 
parking lot at the church, would there still be an ability to do that off of Beaumont? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. So I, I spoke over somebody. Oh no, it's okay. This is Jessica. I was just going to say yes. Um, if you look at the attachment um, labeled right of way abandonment something or other letter, I believe that's the right one. Um, bullet bulletin. There's. You can see how um, Velvet Street is running, I guess, adjacent to the property line and dead ends, if you will, into Beaumont Street. And so the hatched area that's on the south side of Velvet Street would be the swap, if you will. And so essentially what they're doing is um, providing an equal, more or less an equal amount of of right of way on that side so that the width, the overall width will still be maintained. Okay, great. And so in from like a grade perspective and an access perspective, you feel if we did want to do something, there would be, if there still gives us an opportunity. I know that there's some slope there and I'm just trying to figure out if we wanted to do a path, it'd, it'd still be accessible. That's my understanding, and that's one of the reasons I understand that this was the city's request to try to um, offset, I guess, the impact that that's happened and, and trying to maintain the possibility of a future connection there. Okay, great, thank you. Um, if uh, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the request to close the southwest portion of the unopened alley at Velvet Street uh, that connects with Beaumont Street and Eagle Street. I second that. Okay, so I've got a, a motion uh, and a second. Um, the, um, there, was a, there was a mouthful, so let me get a motion from Dennis Wenzel. Um, oops, uh, yeah. Um, to uh, recommend that we close a portion, uh, a part of the southwestern portion of the unopened alley named Velvet Street that connects uh, Beaumont Street to Eagle Street. Uh, and I've got a second that came from, where did that come from? Patricia Katz? Okay, uh, Jessica's saying yes. Uh, so we're gonna open that up to a roll call. Uh, let's go with Randy Warren. Aye. Okay. Um, Kenny Armstrong. Aye. Okay. Dennis Winsel. Aye. Patricia Katz. Aye. And Michael Stratton, uh, myself. Uh, aye. So the motion has passed. Um, and that again is to um, recommend to city council uh, that we close a portion of southwestern uh, portion of unopened alley named Velvet Street that connects Beaumont Street to Eagle Street. Okay, uh, so the next one up is a uh, right of way closure for, um, let's see, this one is close the northern portion of an open, unopened alley connecting Trade Street with West Haywood Street. So we'll, again, we're gonna defer to Jessica for a report. Hi, um, so this one is um, also has the, the information and documents, including the staff report provided. Um, and the TRC has reviewed this. However, the TRC recommended denial, um, but I personally think that um, that this one should potentially be considered for a recommendation of approval. Um, essentially what we have here is, and if you look in the staff report, there's a very helpful uh, map that provides an, an, an aerial view of the property. And the property is on the, um, basically the, it's the south, let's see, the southeast, corner of, of Trade Street and Robert Street. Um, it's a T intersection. And the red box 
shows you the requested right of way to be closed, which is um, what I, I guess I would describe as the northern half of what is what is an unopened right of way that was platted between Trade Street and Haywood Street. Um, and if you look at this aerial, you can see um, the southern half of that unopened alley. There appears to be a single family home there that is actually partially or almost fully constructed within that unopened, um, unopened right of way. And therefore, from a practical standpoint, there does not appear to be any possibility of a future connection there. And, and from my professional perspective, I don't know that there really is any, even if there were a possibility of some kind of connection there from a transportation standpoint, I don't know that it would be very beneficial to us since it's essentially um, a half a block off of Robert Street. So the applicant um, is requesting the this northern part of the unopened alley to be to be closed. Half of that would go um, to the applicant, and the other half would go to the adjacent single-family home at 28 Trade Street. And um, essentially, what the applicant is interested in doing is having a, a, a little bit more property so that they will be able to move forward with a plan uh, plan development, which I believe includes um, four units of housing infill development. Um, and I do believe that the applicant is here with us today to answer any questions as well. Um, but my my professional opinion is that I do not see the benefit from a transportation standpoint to denying this request. Um, I think that staff in the um, technical review committee, I think that the primary concern about this was that um, there's, there's ongoing discussion at a staff level about whether or not it's appropriate to close unopened rights of way to therefore provide additional buildable square footage for a development project um, to then be able to, I guess, more successfully um, meet the standards and requirements for the development project that would ultimately come forward. And so it's kind of a philosophical internal debate that's taking place. And we continue to work on developing some criteria that we will bring forward to you guys to have a more um, objective way to look at these. Um, but in the meantime, um, the applicant wished to bring this forward despite TRC's uh, recommended denial. And, um, and I just wanted to provide kind of my perspective on it as well. Hey, Jessica, do we ever, would we ever work on a situation where we could exchange some right away for more easement? I know on Roberts, you know, as the, but, you know, as, as Chicken Hill kind of develops more and more, we're having more transportation issues there. There, There's really no way for a bicycle to get by there safely. Um, there's a bit of an arc to the road. So there really is, the, the sight lines are bad. Is there ever a situation where we could ask for something like that, where we maybe at some point we could, you know, piece together or cobble together all these different pieces so we could actually have a sidewalk to be a little bit safer for pedestrians? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's kind of a complicated situation. Um, technically, legally, with a right-of-way closure, it's it's not um, we're not able to condition it. In, in other words, we're not able to require conditions for in exchange for an approval for a right-of-way closure. Um, the only time that we can condition something is for a development application that's requiring some kind of, you know, conditional use permit zoning change. And um, so it's kind of a, a weird, um, unfortunate, in my opinion, situation where 
technically we're not allowed to ask for anything in exchange or require anything, um, condition anything with this. But what we're trying to move move to is is pairing these requests, these right of way requests, with the ultimate development plans, if if that's possible, so that we can have a conversation with applicants more directly about whether there's an opportunity um, through the development application side um, to have some benefit to the city. I will say in this case that from what I've seen of their kind of concept initial plans, you know, there will be sidewalk provided on their frontage um, that is, I think, a requirement of the development code anyways, but I don't know um, if we can require, for example, uh, them to provide the city with additional right of way on like the Robert Street side um, of their property. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, I guess I have so we're in just in a, we're tra I know transportation, but in reading the comments from the city, it does again kind of um, cause me concern that someone's trying to maximize their development potential from a property that maybe it shouldn't. You know, the, the property's a certain size, and they're saying, "Well, hey, if we get to move up this little way from here, we can build more." Um, we certainly don't have a problem with building here in Asheville from the grounds of having lots of building. Um, I certainly, uh, if you're trying to build, it's yeah, a problem because there's not much space to build. But um, well, unfortunately, that's not to say a transportation issue, which is not ours, but just from a concerned citizen standpoint, that, that does concern me. I've got a couple of comments. Um, sorry, I missed the first one. Sorry, I'm coming in a little bit late to the meeting. This is Joe Archibald. Um, one comment would be, and this goes back to the whole trying to get these right of ways reworked and how they're presented. I, I still think there needs to be when right of way closures are requested, there needs to be a development plan that is submitted with it so that we can see what the bigger picture is. It's hard, I think, to, you know, look at these in kind of a removed standpoint when there's not the broader context of, of what's gonna happen in the future or what might happen in the future. Um, you know, particularly in an area like this where Chicken Hill is exploding and I would, you know, kind of note that, um, in the staff report, there's a comment here that there's, what is it, five paper rights of way within a one block area uh, of this current one. And, you know, it, it, maybe it's not a road, maybe it's not a sidewalk, but, you know, it's a could be a greenway path in the future. I think, you know, again, I think there needs to be a bigger, broader view instead of just, oh, let's take this one out, let's take this one out, let's take this one out, and, you know, 10 years down the road, we're going to realize we gave up all this and we really want them. Um, and then the second thing, and, and I don't know, I have not looked at this one, um, and I wish I could have asked it at the last one, is in light of the city council's recent um, uh vote on holding any city owned land uh, that was part of urban renewal um, for potential use for reparations. I, I don't know that any of Chicken Hill was urban renewal, but I would just like to bring that up in the context of, you know, what the city is dealing with in a larger, bigger scope. So that's it. Joe, I think those are, are, are good points. Um, I, I, it's a good idea to have that part of the conversation. But you know, as far as th these petitioners are concerned, I, they're they're here with us today. Perhaps they they fill us in a little bit. Yeah, this is uh, Jesse Minch with Minch Construction. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So, yeah, um, a couple of points. I think. Um, with what Joe just brought up as far as, you know, his concern with just uh, closing right away, closing this one, closing that one, and then not having them. I feel like he's speaking real generically to that and you have to look at each case. Um, you also keep mentioning Chicken Hill. And if you actually went out to this site, 
it's not what you think of when you think of Chicken Hill. We are not up on the hillside on the windy part of Chicken Hill. We are all the way down at the bottom by the, I believe it's a Methodist church there, um, across the street from where White Duck Taco used to be. Um, the roads there are not steep and windy or anything. Um, and this alley really, it really doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, like Jessica was saying, it's literally a half a block from trade to West Haywood, which the house on West Haywood already sits in the alley. Um, you know, this, this alley, I was looking back today, there's a survey from 1906 that's got this alley drawn in. Um, you know, that's when they stuck it there and our lot as well as the lots all around it are all drawn as residential lots. Since then, zoning's changed. We're now uh, River Arts District zoning, which is very new. Um, if, if we were still residential and we were just building a house there, we probably wouldn't even be going for this alley closure. You could, you could fit a house there just fine. Uh, like someone commented, I think, about us trying to get more land just so that we could build a bigger structure. That's not at all what we're going for, which is why we, when we came with the presentation, we bought we brought our initial uh, site plans and such. Um, the concept for the building isn't really changing. We are already required to have the main level commercial with storefront. Um, the two stories above that are residential just to get uh, more use out of the building. Um, River Arts District zoning allows for us to do a three-story building. So if we're gonna have, you know, a main floor storefront with commercial space, we thought it'd be great to have, you know, a couple floors of apartments above to add um, residential, you know, living corridors for artists or whatever comes in and chooses to take space in the commercial space at the bottom. Um, so, so the structure isn't really changing where the constraints are is since this is a really small original residential lot and now we're in the river arts district zoning we're required with handicapped parking we're required with you know eight nine parking spaces uh like jessica mentioned we have to have sidewalks on robert street we have to have sidewalks on trade street we have to have landscape plan with parking trees and and screening so when you try to fit all that in to the space that we have, that extra 10 feet that we would gain by partially closing this alley becomes super valuable, not for making our structure bigger, but for accommodating, turning a handicapped van around, having the hash space for parking a handicapped van, having the dumpsters on site, putting in the plannings for screening the residential that is above us. Above us is residential, even though we're, you know, River Arts District zoning. So, you know, we want to be able to put trees and stuff to screen off our parking lot. Um, so all that kind of comes into play, um, you know, based on the fact that that we're a little bit different zoning than, than some of the other lots around us. Um, and the one other hardship that we have is we are right on that corner section where they've recently done all of the um, high voltage line work and replaced a lot of poles with the big, huge uh, steel rusted looking poles. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the work down there. Um, one of those, you know, big steel power line poles actually sits on the corner of our lot and the overhead lines are running on the edge of our lot. So we've also got this, you know, 20 foot power easement that's cutting in on our corner of our lot there as well. Um, so it's, it's just getting really tight. Um, for a commercial project. Um, and, and when we purchased, this is Aaron, Jesse's partner, Aaron Mench, Mench Construction. When we purchased the property, it was 2013, and it was under the zoning code of a residential property when we purchased the lot. And then it was changed to the River Arch zoning, which is fine with us after we had purchased the lot. So it was a change that we had that came about to change. Like Jesse said, this is a flat, completely flat lot at the bottom of Chicken Hill. So when you do compare it to other that Chicken Hill area, it is a little different. This this lot is most of Chicken Hill is residential. This is actually zoned to red red zoning. So 
Well, does does anybody have any, any, any questions for the um, petitioners? Um, I'm just going to say that I, I, I think this is this is a good situation where we're going to be able to increase some density of, of, of uh, residential. Our city is always in need of, of more housing units. We've got a, um, a real problem with affordable housing. Not to say that these are necessarily going to be affordable, but the fact that we can increase the volume of overall housing stock in Asheville is always a good thing, in my opinion. And then the fact that there's going to be sidewalks too. And there will be sidewalks. Um, so to have a, a, excellent. Do you have any more comments, guys? Anybody? I'll just make one more real quick. Yeah, I, I I do very much realize exactly where the property is, and I do know that it sits in that RAD form-based code. I think you guys are in the neighborhood transition on that end of it, I believe. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I certainly don't have any problems with commercial development or anything. Again, it has more to do with the way the, with the process that the whole right-of-way closure is is trying to get to or at least where i would like to see it get to where we see the full development plans of what's going on and again realizing that some of these rights of way even if we maintain an eight foot right of way that becomes a five foot little alley sidewalk that starts to create a more urban environment through these what are urbanizing and densifying areas is is important so um yeah i mean i applaud you guys for doing the project i mean it's great so yeah, don't don't get me wrong on that, guys. Sorry. Sure. Yeah. No, that we understand. Sense. We understand. And and one other thing that I did forget to mention too, when you when you mentioned that it was coming to you guys with denial from TRC, if you look at the report, there is approval from the majority. There was just to the street and planning that said deny, but there was a number of people on that committee that did give approval. Just as a side note. And, and Joe, I hear what you're saying. Um, and you know, we've got on um, today's right agenda uh, right of way closure process discussion. And I think at the, the next opportunity, we can we can make sure that that gets put in our, our next agenda. So because this is an important topic, I think it, it makes sense that we we discuss that. Um, but in terms of the case by case, like the, the uh, petitioners had mentioned, you know. I, uh, take it by case by case and, and look at the, the facts on the ground as we see them. Uh, and in this this particular case, I, I, in my opinion, uh, uh, for a recommendation. Yeah, hey, this is Kenny. I just wanted to say that from a multimodal transportation perspective, I don't I don't see any use in the right of way. So. And, and as the applicant noted, there is a house on West Haywood that sits partially in the existing right of way. So, um, you know, if the city wanted to build a multi use trail through there, they're going to have to demolish that house to get through there. So, um, you know, if I was walking in this neighborhood or riding my bike, I don't think adding this extra leg of, of access would really help in any way. So, I, I just don't see a need for um for this location to add a sidewalk or a greenway surely not a mass transit route either so um i, I think i would recommend that it, it be approved yeah i mean maybe I'd add, that just just add on that real quickly that a sidewalk through the unopened right away but definitely a sidewalk though mm -hmm. on the street robert street because i actually ride my bike through there quite a bit because I can't get down right now, the way Meadow is, it's, it's prohibitive to me to travel that way. So to get to River Arts District, so I actually take Roberts quite a bit. So that it's, we're forcing, you know, people on that traffic more. So, so, so I'm glad you're putting a sidewalk. I know which is required for the development. I wish we could require retrofitting sidewalks the whole way there because that area of the street is definitely going to see more bikes, more peds, a lot more based because of the other activities going on there too. So. So that the, the fact you're putting a sidewalk there is actually helps a lot in terms of the multimodal transportation in that area. That's it's like you know it's changing a lot, and it's going to have more bikes and pets. I mean, I see people walking there now in the street a lot, and the more traffic it gets, the more dangerous it's going to be for that to happen. 
Well, and that goes back to, to Joe's point. You know, if we saw a development plan, we could make the case and say, well, you're adding sidewalks here and here. So we're a little bit more comfortable with it. Okay, guys, um, I'm going to I'm gonna ask that we, we, we wrap this one up because I think we're, we're, we've reached a consensus. Can we, can we get a, are we done with, with comments? If we are, then I'm going to ask that we move on to, um, and for this process. For a motion, Michael? Sorry, what was that, Dennis? Do you need a motion on this? Uh, if we're done with comments, but I, I, I think, uh, I think, I, I think we should be done with we comments do. at this point. We've got a, we've got a lot, lot left on the agenda. So if we're if we're done, then I'm gonna um, I'm gonna ask for a yeah, motion. Yeah, we need a motion. Go. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, I do, it's one last statement is I, I kind of agree with Randy. I feel like, you know, we're kind of getting put between a rock and a hard place here. Um, I think that we're setting a weird precedent to, cut, you know, we are running into issues where we're going to not have these opportunities to create these uh, interesting ways for people to uh, to tra traverse these uh, communities. And so I'm not crazy about this, but the fact there's a house smack dab in the middle of the, you know, the other half of the alley seems weird. Um, it seems like, you know, maybe we should as a group should just go down there and knock on their door and figure out why that happened and we can get an answer to that. But instead of that, I'd like to move that we uh, approve the petition that has been submitted to close the northern portion of an open-ended alley connecting Trade Street and Haywood Street. Okay, we've got a, a motion. We have a second. Second. Who is, uh, who is that? It's, it's Kenny. That's Kenny. Okay, we've got a, a, a motion from Dennis Winsel. Um, and a second um, from Kenny Armstrong that um, we recommend that we um, recommend to city council to close in front of me um, to, uh, close the northern portion of an unopened alley connecting Trade Street to Haywood Street. Um, so we're going to do a roll call. On hey, that. hey, Michael, can I yeah. amend that? Yeah. Um, I, I would I would like to add that the recommendation be to remove the entire right of way, including the the, the southern portion of it as well. But that might be a different motion. Um, yeah, I mean that that would make sense to me, Jessica. Is that is that, is that not what we're talking about here? Uh, you, are you referring to the the portion that the house is sitting in? Yeah, it seems silly to remove the northern section without removing the southern section as well. Yeah, yeah my understanding is that, and, and I might not be correct, but I don't believe that, well, well firstly, I think that um, the applicant actually did have a conversation with the with the owner of that property and they indicated that they were not interested in doing that um please correct me if i'm wrong and that and if in in that case i'm not sure that we can can do so without their permission um perhaps we can but um i would have to have legal help help me understand if that is an op is an option um, you know, keep in mind that whenever we close one of these, um, for better or for worse, the property becomes taxable property. Um, so it would go to, you know, the property owner and then would be increasing their, their ownership, you know, their, their square footage of their, of their lot. And so, um, I would hesitate to unilaterally do that without any kind of legal counsel opinion. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, never mind, Michael. Continue. <laughs> okay, so um, let's uh, let's proceed with the roll call as was originally stated for the northern portion. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, Randy Warren. Yes. Okay. Um, Kenny Armstrong. Aye. Dennis Winsel. Aye. Patricia Katz. Aye. Uh, myself, Michael Stratton, aye. Uh, the motion is passed. Um, we are passed on the motion um, to recommend the closure of the northern portion of an open alley connecting Trade Street and Haywood Street. Okay. Good discussion. Let's move on to the next one.
the next one uh, is a right of way closure for a portion of the intersection uh, of Houston Street and Cortland Ave. Jessica, you want to take us away? Sure. Um, so, you know, just as an aside, these are all really interesting examples and case studies for us and, and kind of show you the range of, of right of way closures. Um, and so, you know, this is all really good conversation because it's going to help us prepare um, better for what ultimately will be the policy that will come forward. So that's just an aside. Um, this one is closing a portion of the intersection of Houston Street and Cortland Avenue. This is generally over in the Montford, kind of Southern Montford neighborhood. Um, and this one is kind of an interesting difference because it's essentially asking for um, some additional property that is now right of way on, on a corner. And so it's not really a question of is there, is there a connection that can be made here? It's not, um, I guess, denying us the ability to provide any kind of connectivity in the future. Um, we as staff have required that there would be um, sidewalk easement provided and um, and maintenance easement, I believe, and, and staff from TRC has recommended that we approve this. And um, the applicant, I, I believe, is also here to answer any questions if there are any. Um, and that's, that's, I think, all I have to say on this one. Yeah, I think this corner is this corner shouldn't be like the way it is. That needs to be a sharper turn, and it needs to be a, a shorter distance for people across the street. That is, it, it, we it, we need to have this have, this this closure is needed to have happen because we, right now it's dangerous. It'll be less dangerous intersection from a bicycle and pedestrian standpoint if we give this easement and they and they shore up the corner. Can we make that a requirement? Did they make that corner then? A real corner there so that you couldn't shortcut it the way it is and make it easier to get across the street um i do i don't know that we could require it i'm not sure exactly what the what the applicant or the property owner's desire is to do with this and perhaps they can can provide us with some additional information um i'm i'm assuming that there's a reason for wishing to have this additional space and I don't, we can't require anything as a condition of approval for a right of way um, closure, but um, it would, it would be good to get some additional information from the applicant if they're, if they're able to. Yes. Um, hi, we're available to uh, discuss this. Um, yeah, basically, you know, we started this procedure because of a, uh, some harassment from our neighbor who would who would come into the yard and um, you know and and harass us and when we would call the police he would he would um, show them that that he's on city property and not actually you know on our property um, and um, you know we ended up having to get a, a lawyer involved and he recommended that we get this that asked the city to um, close this right away so. Um, you know, so that we would own a little more of our yard because um, we do have a, an unusually large city right of way at the at the edge of our property. And I guess Chad Bandy, the you know, the streets division manager, seemed to think that it was from the um, the original I-26 construction when they got, um, I guess they took a little more easement than they needed for that project. And, you know, and this, it doesn't come anywhere near I-26 at currently but um you know that he suspects that that may have been when the city sort of um took this property as um you know under easement great uh thanks for your comments can you tell me i, I noticed in the write-up that uh, the someone with transportation was talking about an 11 and a half foot uh, easement versus a five foot. What's your position on that? And then what is the uh, the stakes that you have out there currently? Is that the 11 and a half foot line? Or you have a couple of lines that are in there. What's what's going on there? Right. There's a couple different lines. Um, 
you know, the, the one closest to the curb represents what we're asking for. And that would be a, that would leave the city with a five foot right of way for sidewalks. And the, um, the, the person last week from the sidewalk division said that would be adequate. Um, it's like, I think they would still have a, they would still have 11 feet. Um, they'd still have an easement to go bigger if needed, but like officially they would have five feet. Um, and, um, there's also there's a center set of uh, markers and that represents the um, stormwater um, right of easement and then um, the innermost markings is where the current actual edge of our property okay so, thanks yeah there's a lot going on out there so that makes sense to me right. um so jessica does the does our uh request include that 11 and a half foot or the five foot what's where where are we at in, that, in those uh numbers my so my understanding is that um the five foot width of sidewalk is in in inside of the 11 and a half feet so the 11 and a half feet is being provided by the applicant. And within that space, there would be the opportunity to construct a sidewalk of at least five feet. Um, that's not, that's, you know, to be clear, the applicant is not proposing to construct that sidewalk. We're just reserving the right to do so and the space to do so with this. Okay, great. Yeah, and I, I, I think that makes sense. We're not asking them to build that sidewalk right now. I just want to leave us the opportunity to do that in the future. Um, so I'd like to make a motion that we approve this request um, amended to uh, the additional six and a half foot of easement, which will be, I think, a total of 11 and a half feet, um, as stated from the transportation uh, comment. Does that make sense? Let me see if I can word that a little bit better here. Hang on a second. Um, I'd like to approve, uh, make a motion that we approve the portion of the uh, intersection of Houston Street and Cortland Avenue to include an 11 and a half foot, revised to an 11 and a half foot uh, easement. I, I second the motion. Okay. Motion on the table as well as a second. Uh, to close uh, a portion of the intersection of Houston Street and Cortland Ave, but also to include a 11 and a half foot easement. How would that go? Sorry. <laughs> right, to revise to an 11 and a half foot easement. Uh, but to revise to an 11 and a half foot easement. Does that capture it, Jessica? Um, I believe so. Does okay. that is I just want to I just want to confirm with the applicant that that is is correct and, or is consistent with their understanding of what you're talking. Yeah. Oh yes, that that seems fine with me. Okay. That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move to a roll call vote, um, and we'll start with Randy Warren. Aye. Okay. Um, Kenny Armstrong. Aye. Uh, Dennis Winslow. Aye. And Patricia Katz. Aye. And myself, Michael Stratton. Aye. Uh, the motion is passed. Uh, okay. So um, we, just, uh, just, just real quick. So I, I write it down. Who made the second on that motion? I know Dennis made the motion. I wasn't sure who seconded. Brent, Randy. Okay. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Sorry about that. Okay. It looks like uh, we've got one more. And this one is a right away for Aston Street requesting that a portion of the 12 foot wide alley that connects to Aston Street be eliminated. Jessica. Uh, sorry, excuse me. I'm just trying to bring up the, the information on my computer being a little slow. Um, so this is in the, in the downtown area. Um, 
we are looking at an alleyway that is um, essentially a dead end, if I recall correctly. And um, the applicant, I believe, owns um, several of the properties that are adjacent to or surround this this property, but I do not believe all of them are. Um, and my so the TRC staff report does not provide a recommendation. Um, there's concern that I believe that the 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 general concern and the and for those departments that are not supportive of it is that there's not a proposed development plan in hand to see what the ultimate um, what the ultimate closure would would be used for. Um, there's concern with perhaps impacts to access, loading, service delivery, et cetera. And I would say this one, this one is similar in many ways. If you recall, I don't remember exactly when it was, but it wasn't that long ago where um, the Multimodal Commission was looking at the, I think it was called Create 72 or, or something like that over on Biltmore. Um, similar situation with what is largely a, a dead end alley. Um, but at that point, we, we did also have a, a development plan in hand. And so um, generally speaking, the, the departments are, are not supportive at this time um, until there is um, some additional information that is provided. Hey, Michael, I can step in. Um, so in looking at this one, this is the one where I felt like I, it just it didn't seem like it was the, the best fit. Um, I just feel like there's that alley, even though it doesn't go anywhere, it still accesses the back of those properties. And so if there's something that's built, it's still going to provide services, uh, trash and deliveries and those types of things. But it also can provide, you know, we're starting to see some of these rear building storefronts popping in. So I think it, that's what kind of makes uh, Asheville some of its, uh, it has, gives it that unique quality where those spaces can be used for people to, maybe they're not passing through, but the space can be used. So I just don't see how, um, you know, uh, it's something that really makes sense from, uh, from our standpoint. Also, when I look at it, it looks like that alley, can you go through the alleyway into the uh, parking lot to the west? Because um, when I Google map it, it looks like there's a, an alleyway that curves around to the left and connects over to South Lexington. Is that accessible? I believe so. Um, no, it's not dead end then. Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm the, we're the owner. Sure, I don't know if you, you want to. We, um, that, that. GIS showing of a tail going out to the east-west does not exist in the record anywhere. It doesn't exist. We just had an ALTA survey done. There's no, and I'm sorry, I'm Pat Whalen with Public Interest Projects, and we're we're a 50% member in this LLC that owns this property. Um, but there is no east-west connection, and that is a dead end alley. And the area marked in red on our on our submission, all of the property around that is our, it dead ends into our property and all the property to the east and all the property to the west is our property. So we are the only, we are the only ones bordering the portion of the alley that we're trying to get closed. And there is nowhere to go on the property. So that's, it's, it's really just part of this is a large parcel, uh, just about, I don't know, there's no, I can, sh it, it's uh, the two, the two long parcels that are just north of the alley are part of our property. And then all the property down to Aston Street to the, to the west is our property. And then all the property where the cars are parked now is our property. So it's one development parcel that can, that, you know, it's on Biltmore Avenue, obviously, so it allows to build a reasonably sized building there. And there's not going to be a big hole cut out of the middle, I wouldn't think. We, we've done plans on this in the past, and the reason we're trying to get it closed now is it's just an impediment 
to getting this property developed. It's been in search of the title to look for this east-west thing. Um, there hasn't been a new building built on this parcel in over a hundred years now. And it's really time it does more, it makes more of a contribution to downtown than it's making right now. Um, we haven't asked to close the southern portion because our neighbors to the south, they, they do use that alley and that's, and that's fine. It's just we have no intention to use this alley and nobody we've ever talked to about this property has ever had the intention to use that alley. That, thank you. That helped a lot. You told me you answered several of my questions. Just to be clear, Mr. Whalen, um, so if I look at the plat uh, map that was in our documents, you're saying that your organization owns what on on built fronts on Biltmore Avenue is listed on this plat as track four, track one, and track five, and then also and, and track five runs from Biltmore all the way to South Lexington. And then you also own tract three, which fronts on South Lexington, but not tract two, or you do own tract no, two? No, we, we own all those tracts. I don't have that, okay. that survey right in front of me, but the only but, thing we don't own that you can see, we don't own, I'm, I'm looking now at the uh, staff report. Okay. At okay. the staff report, there's one, there's one parcel you can see the, on, on Lexington, you see green space and then a building. That parcel way north of us, we don't own that. Everything south of that, we own, except for th that building on Biltmore that you see 37 Biltmore, 39 Biltmore, and 41 Biltmore. Those, okay. those three parcels are the only things we don't own. Okay, yeah. where, where Doc Chase used to be and then the uh, coffee bus. Right, 30, 30, 37 is Doc Chase. Okay. And 41 is the coffee bus. Okay. This is Jeffrey with Civil Design Concepts. Uh, you own all five tracks on that survey. I have the survey right. up. Yeah. yeah, okay, good. Okay. Thanks, Jesse. Okay. And, and so you, you mentioned that you have done development um, proposals for this or have one currently or no, we do not have one currently we really okay. tried to do a uh, at a workforce and affordable housing project three or four years ago on this site but we had to, it had to be done with some cooperation with the city and we couldn't the city just didn't have an ability to they, they needed to delay any kind of looking at it to the point where the project went away so, so yeah. nothing happened and frankly, this is just, this is just to us, this is kind of low hanging fruit to make this property easier to develop in the future because already the development process is obviously takes a lot of time and we want this pro property, all our property, we've tried to develop as intensely as we can to provide housing downtown. And this is just, to, to us, it's just inefficient to have it there in the middle of our property when Technically, we could just put concrete walls around it, and, and I guess even go over the top of it, and it's <laughs> and it's a nuisance, you know. And yeah. so it just made sense to well, let's get this part closed. We we respect our. If we tried to close the southern part too, we'd get half of the property to the middle of the road because we own that down there. But that's not our neighbors need that, and that's fine. Leave the southern part open and just close the part that's all enclosed in our property. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, and I, I, I certainly, um, you know, this is kind of one of those, uh, you know, again, I'm just going to say it one more time. This is where we need the development plans up front on right-of-way closures, period, multimodal, PNZ, wherever they go. Um, you know, th this one I can definitely, it is similar to the Create 72 Broadway where, you know, you're still going to, I would imagine if you do any development on that lot, you would be looking at, hey, here's an alley we can use it for. Um, similar to what Create 72 was going to do, which is trash access. And I think they, you know, also perhaps, you know, if you were to do some structured parking, maybe it's an egress or an or, or an exit for structured parking. Um, you know, again, looking at it as a project specific, thinking about what could come, thinking and knowing what public interest projects has done in the past, I could see this one being, you know, a, a reasonable request. Um, for sure. So, um, yeah, I, I would just thank you, Mr. Whalen, because I know you guys, your your public public interest projects has done a lot of good stuff downtown. So, thank you. We try. Hey, I, 
I wonder in terms of our, and Jessica, maybe you can help with this too, but is what's, and I, and I know like Joe was just saying, we don't have a, a real good understanding of why we design things that we do in Asheville. We just don't have a good plan for it. But using the alleyways oftentimes is a way to take off that kind of, um, you know, service vehicles that are doing the trash and those kind of things or deliveries or, you know, those kind of things. So if we take away the alleyway, does that take away that philosophy of being able to do that with any construction that goes into that property? Or is it that not an issue in this case? Well, it, do, it doesn't really because the alley is still, the southern part of the alley is still there. So I guess technically we could reach our property from it, but all the, you know, hypothetical plans we've tried to do. We have a ton of frontage. You know, we have a ton of frontage on Biltmore, a ton of frontage on Aston, and a ton on Lexington. So, you know, we, we feel like, I think all the preliminary plans we've done in the past have always used one of those streets for access because it's it, it's harder to back a dump truck or, you know, a trash truck or something up an alley 100 feet or something. That, that will cause problem for our neighbors too. So, all of our plans have always just tried to access from the main streets. But from a transportation perspective, though, it's better because if you have garbage trucks and delivery trucks and everything else using the front of the street, then that blocks off access for pedestrians and for bicycles and for everything else in the street too. So oftentimes cities like bigger cities or, you know, not back, you know, like when they have these new age cities, they have alleys and the driveways off the alleys, that kind of stuff instead of the front of the street is to make those streets safer, to have less traffic coming in and out of those, roadways that are being accessed by pedestrians and bicycles and so having the alley access to that rather than the front of the street is actually safer for uh, vulnerable users well that 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 may be it's gonna it would if we really tried to make heavy use of that alley i think it would cause problems for our neighbors because like the doc chase site needs to put their dumpster somewhere and the other the people down below there's a there's two apartments i think there's two apartments in that building uh just north of the double decker bus so I, I think it'd be a problem for those people if that alley was being used for heavy you know heavy truck stuff coming in and out but you you, you know that part of the planning better than i do I, I just it just seemed to make more sense just to close this part of the alley and then i i guess if the final final plan you know, suggest using the alley still, we still can use it because it still dead ends against our property. This is why I asked the question of Jessica, and maybe you know, again, it's planning that transportation. It, is that the kind of consideration we'd have in approving a project that minimizing access to a main street because of the problems that causes for multimodal transportation? I, I don't know. From. Randy, just real um, quick, I mean, speaking yeah, from a planning I, I, design, I don't think we had a, a big discussion with that on Create 72 in that whole alley. I'll just throw in also that that sidewalk on Lexington, to me, is one of the worst sidewalks in downtown. And again, this thing hadn't been built on in 100 years, and I'd like to see development ultimately happen here and have decent sidewalks show up on Lexington Avenue because up up north of us there's you know some of those four foot sidewalks with big utility poles right in the middle of them and it's kind of a disgrace for the city. Mr. Boylan, would you know what, what what the, the, the plan is for the development? You know what the nature of the development would be are we talking I don't I do not I don't I do not know for sure now. I said like I said the the prototype we worked up before was workforce and affordable, uh, but again, the city couldn't really work with us on that one as we expected and as they originally thought they could. I, I would predict it will be housing of some sort well, because that's what we try to support. Well, you know, from 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 my perspective, I, I, I look at the downtown as, as hugely essential to multimodal transportation in, in general, to have um, you know, people that live in downtown makes the um, the transit system work better. It makes our uh, our facilities work better. Um, so anytime we can we can get more density in the urban core in terms of housing, I think that's a good call. But if if this is for hell, I can tell you, I wouldn't be supportive of it because I think the minute that we supplant square footage with a hotel, 
that that makes the whole system as far as multimodal transit not function the way it should. So that's what the nature of my question. That's why I was um, inquiring as, as far as are we talking housing for, for, for residents or are we talking about a, a hotel? I'll tell you, there there is no current plan. Um, I will tell you, we've tried a number of plans over the years on this site. And, you know, again, uh, in this area of downtown is a pretty high value area. So it's going to be a decent sized building. I don't think it's going to be an office building. Um, I don't know if we need any more hotels, but I can't. I can't tell you right now what it'll be. I just, this looked like something we should try to take care of now to make the ultimate thing easier to get developed and get it built and not be delayed. You know, one of the big problems we have with real estate development is you start your plans and you deal with the processes. And then by the time you've finished with a project of this size, it's a different world you're in and COVID's out there causing trouble or whatever. And uh, we were just trying to take one of the impediments out to getting this, to putting this thing in a position where we could see something happen on it. Okay, Jessica. Um, so I just wanted to to say that this is part. This is kind. Of, it's kind of a catch twenty two. Um, you know, in my experience, the the development the developer wants to have the right of way approval or right of way of closure approval so that they can, um, I think, have more um, feel more secure. In, in what they're dealing with um, in terms of a future application for, for a, an actual project to be constructed. And, and then on the flip side, the, from the government perspective, it makes us feel insecure to abandon or close the right of way when we don't know exactly what's going to happen with it in the future. And so um, that's why we're trying to get to this place where while we may not be able to require um, applicants for right-of-way closures to provide development plans at the same time, we're highly encouraging that because we want to have those two things go forward at the same time. And so while there is some risk, um, perhaps from the developer's perspective, um, we feel from a staff perspective that that um, risk is kind of shared between the two. If they're processed simultaneously, um, where we have something to look at that says, okay, we're, we're providing right of way, you're providing this project, and we can look at those two things at the same time. That's the goal um, that we're trying to get at. And I think that from the TRC and the notes that are in the TRC, the, that sentiment is carried through that we really would like to see what we're dealing with so that we can make a more um, objective decision and analysis of, of the issue. And so, um, you know, I would encourage the applicant to bring this back to us when there's a development plan in hand or a concept, at least something that we can look at to provide some additional detail to the decision maker. Bingo. In decision on this without having a, an idea of what's actually going to go there. Because honestly, the highest for that space might very well be a hotel, but that's not the highest and best use for the citizens of Asheville. Well, can I say something? This is Kenny. Um, I, you know, I, the Aloft Hotel is right there, which a lot of people had a, a, a negative reaction to, but I see it as a fairly successful project. Um, it fills a lot of needs. And if you remember what was there before, it was a gravel surface parking lot, which is probably the least valuable use of land in downtown Asheville. And this applicant has uh, what is essentially a large gravel parking lot in the heart of downtown and he's trying to build on it. And my take is if removing the right of way helps him get rid of this gravel surface parking lot it's it's a good investment for all parties it also could, sounds like um mr whalen that you have examples of your, what you have done in the past would that um would you have any um similar um 
construction ideas for this property? Or is it someone else making those decisions? Well, no, no. We we are the ones that were behind the uh, the Aloft 51 Biltmore parking garage project. We put that project together. We owned that property, that gravel lot across the street. And a hotel developer came to us and wanted to buy it. And we said, no, um, we, we won't sell it unless we can get the city involved to build a parking garage because the south side of downtown has an abysmal lack of parking and still does for that matter. Um, so that was one of our projects that we put together. We've done a number of the projects on uh, Haywood Street. We did the old Asheville Hotel where Malaprops is. We did the Penny's Building where Mobilia is on the first floor. We did the Orange Peel. We still have the Orange Peel. We uh, worked with John Cram on the on the Fine Arts Theater. We've done a number of restaurants downtown. I mean, we've done a. I mean, our website has a list of all our projects. Uh, but I, again, I don't want to. I'm not trying to sell you all on this. We just saw this as you know, this is just one more kind of block in getting something done when nothing's been done on this property for 100 years. And if we can get this closed, that just makes it a little simpler. We're still going to have to obviously go through the entire development process. The The 51 Biltmore project took like, I think, five years <laughs> before we could get it to come out of the ground. Um, but the city got the parking garage that it needed, which is what I really wanted them to do. We built the apartments behind the parking garage because that was some infill we could do to enliven that street. So, I mean, you can go to our website and look and see the kind of projects we've done, but I don't, I, again, this is, I don't want to make this some big issue. I mean, we, to, to us, we just looked at that alley. It doesn't serve any purpose. We have had not had any plans to use it and it just makes developing the property more sensible. That was, the, that was the reason. Mr. Whalen, most of you sound great. I mean, I, I think most of us can be very proud. Hey, have have you guys seen, but we hear something else. I'm I think sorry? too, our charge is multimodal transportation. Our charge is to watch out for that. And the, and the, the, the Lost Hotel actually is, is, is not good for transportation. I know that, you know, it developed a property, which is fantastic, but having people drop off and pick up in front of the, and build more there is, is dismal for both pedestrians and bicyclists to use that through there. It makes it harder for buses to get through too. So it's a good property build for the city in terms of, you know, putting something there that's useful and having the garage there is great too, but it's, it's terrible to ride your bike through there with all that traffic coming in and out of the hotel. So that's not a good thing from our perspective as a committee for multimodal transportation. It's not a good thing. So, um, the same thing. So we, we, it, it, unless we can see the development ideas about this, I don't, I don't feel comfortable closing that alleyway because we want to take big vehicles and lots of traffic away from the streets <laughs> or make it so slow that no one can get through except for by bike or pedestrian. So that's the, our charge is not the same as, you know, maybe what it would be in terms of a development standpoint is to help make it safer for bikes and pedestrians and transit users. There's, and, you know, again, the Lost Hotel does not do that. It's, it's not a good project in terms of our transportation, you know. So um, well, I, I, at this point, without more information, I think I have to be opposed to the alleyway closure. But I think it's just, it, we, we don't know that if it's going to, how it's going to affect traffic usage for multimodal users. And that's what we're concerned with. I, I will say, and so, you know, multimodal is part of the reason we created our company 30 years ago. You know, we, we were trying to create a dense, livable downtown that people use 24 hours a day to prevent, you know, more sprawl out into the county and onto the mountains and onto the farms and to shorten people's commute and have people walk to work and things like that. I think downtown's being revitalized has done more for multimodal transportation than anything because people now have a reason to come downtown and people love to walk in our downtown. So, you and I didn't sure, the sidewalks are horrible. It's not a good place to bike. So it's good for sure. We want that density, but we haven't done the other parts of it. We haven't improved the sidewalks. We haven't improved the bicycling facilities. We don't have places for buses to get through that easily. So we haven't done those other things. So it's good that we are making it easier to walk or you know, more people to be downtown and stuff. But we need to do those other things though too. And so at this point in our committee, we're tasked with trying to deal with a, a problem. And and part of it, we don't want to contribute to the problem. We want to diminish the problem. But how does this specific piece of right-of-way make it 
I mean, how is because that? that? Because that, that should be taking vehicles off the streets. And so if they're going to have access from Biltmore Avenue for access, that's not a good place. If they could use access to the alleyway, that's a good thing. So we can't have big, huge garbage trucks and delivery trucks being parked on Biltmore and expect people to be able to feel safe riding and walking with that kind of activity on there. We need to move that to places like alleys. I, I don't and believe there's, be, take away. there's not very likely to be any kind of vehicular access off of Biltmore Avenue. You know, we're not going to be driving garbage trucks off of Biltmore Avenue. That, earlier you said that there was so much access from Biltmore Avenue, you would use that rather than the alleyway. No, no. I said we have so much access. We have more access on Aston and Lexington. We have more frontage on Lexington than anywhere. Sure. And Lexington is a bikeway and, and has a horrible sidewalk, like you said. So, um, I, I mean, that's a, that's a, but it, that's a bikeway throughout the city too. It's marked. It's a marked, you know, bicycle way. So I, I don't want to have a lot of vehicles coming in up there too. You know, it, it's we need to make we need to have in order to get people to ride their bikes through downtown. We have to have it be safe to ride downtown. So yep. you might be able to make it that way. I don't know. I'm just saying with the existing information, we don't know. So I couldn't. I'm not in favor of closing the alleyway until we have more information to know that it would be safe still for you to ride your bike or walk your on the sidewalk there. I, I wouldn't mind to chime in as a design professional. I, I, I feel like this is a pretty good dialogue. Um, you know, we we produce the development plans civil wise. I'm civil, so we're generally taking the site, and we've done several projects downtown. Um, you know, uh, I kind of feel it's like it's not necessarily you're wanting to see a development plan because with a development plan, we have to bring all that infrastructure up. That's written into your zoning code. You know, I, I have to redevelop all the sidewalks. I have to maintain the bike paths. Um, the We're not, with this request, we're not diminishing this alley. As a design professional, I'm going to look to utilize that alley for exactly what we need to use it, lies it for. You know, garbage pickup sometimes is that way. Transformers, you know, utility access. Um, gas meters, w water lines, sprinkler riser rooms, emergency uh, access and utility corridors. So, you know, as I get to that level of a design, I'm going to use that alley to the extent I can. Um, where We have to work with transportation department on our access points. So all those things come into play. But the biggest yeah, thing, so that, the biggest- At that the, point, then we'd be happy to approve it. But until we know that stuff, we don't know. That's right. Uh, the biggest hurdle I have here is we're just trying to understand because the, the purpose of this re request is where do we draw our building footprint and work outwards? Is that alley that's on paper right now is not even a, re you know, it's not used as such. I will continue to use as such um, from the portion that remains open to the extent practical around this job. Um, the bar to get to a development plan with architectural drawings and all the 3D and access points is a high bar. Um, and, and a right-of-way closure is a legislative process that goes on to city council. You know, your zoning code of CBD district has plenty of levels of review for the development plan, but they don't always go to the council. I've done a lot of projects in CBD that doesn't get to the point of council but it has full staff review and authority beforehand. And so, you know, obviously I hear hotels not good for uh, uh, for multimodal. Well, that would go to council no matter what, you know, is they're going to get their chance to say no or yes to that. This is um, the first road. But s certain uses, you know, uh, we can do a, a pretty dense project just in residential without going to council. Um, but this right away has to go to council. And it, it's sort of, we have to go a lot, spend a lot of money and just design development to even have a chance for you to say yes or no to this. And it's, it's a high, it's a high bar that uh, I think should be considered when we're bringing, I feel like a pretty reasonable request of a small portion alley that doesn't have major impacts on the multimodal if you exclude the use. I mean, I feel like the use is being played to a bigger extent in this when I, I agree, you want to know it, but we don't know it. We're just trying to we're just trying to get the canvas size right now. Is what is the canvas we have to play with? Gentlemen, if you if you guys talked to me today, what the plan was, and if it was not going to be a hotel, I can tell you today, I would 
I would vote to recommend it, but since we can't do that, I can't do that. Michael, it sounds like obviously I'm the next officio member and I can't vote, but it sounds like we've heard about all of the information that I think folks need to either make a motion um, to approve, recommend approval or recommend denial. But um, I do tend to agree that since there's no project um, plans in place that this won't I to see more information as well. Okay. Um, so that's that's where I'm at with things. I appreciate that, and it does it does sound like everybody's had an opportunity to speak, and it sounds like we we've, we've all had some some pretty uh, serious comment on it, which I think is important that we've been able to flesh that out. But um, uh, if there's any anybody else has anything, if not, I I would ask for a a, a motion on this on this item. Hey, Michael, this is Dennis. Um, I'd like to move that we deny the request uh, on Aston Street, um, that the portion of the 12-foot alleyway that connects Aston Street to be eliminated. Okay, do I have a second? I'm sorry, the motion was to deny the request? Yes. Correct, yes. I'll second it. Okay, so I have a motion and a second. Uh, to deny the request to close uh, the portion of the 12 foot wide alley that connects Aston Street. Um, and so I've got a motion, a second. Uh, we'll go roll call on this. Um, we're going to start with, uh, with Randy Warren. Aye. We've got uh, Kenny Armstrong. Nay. Dennis Winsel. Aye. Uh, we've got Patricia Katz. Nay. And myself, Michael Stratton. Um, actually, you know what? I, I want I want to clarify this before we we do this because I've had a day and a day on on the this might sound as a double second. This this uh, motion was to deny. Um, so Dennis, you were a, a yay on, or, and then we had a series of nays on this. So I just want to be clear. Uh, yes, I'm, su I'm in support of my motion to deny the request. Okay. And we're going to go through that one more time because I want to be really clear on this. Um, so the motion was to deny the portion. Um, the motion is to... Um, not recommend the closure of the 12 foot one alley that connects to the Aston Street, um, that connects to Aston Street. Um, so we went through that one more time. And when we say, I, that's going to be in the affirmative that we're not making the recommendation. Okay. So we'll, we'll do that one more time. Sorry about that, guys. So we're going to go with Randy Warren. Aye. Randy, are you with us? Yes, I, I, I vote well, yes, I. Okay. Um, Kenny Armstrong? Nay, no, no. Okay. Uh, Dennis Wenzel? I. Okay. Patricia Katz? Nay, I think they should be able to close the alleyway and proceed with designing the property. Okay, uh, myself, Michael Stratton, I am an I, so that's got us at, let me tally this up. Two, so we've got two no's and one Uh, so the, uh, the eyes have it on that one. Thank you all. I just want to say we are totally in favor of improving multimodal transportation in Asheville. So keep up your good work. Maybe when we come back, we can get this done. 
and, and before we, Waylon, we, we really do want you to come back and and, and um, have another opportunity to talk to us. Uh, we appreciate the dialogue today. Uh, we just we hope that we have a little bit more information, or at least the the, the folks that uh, that have denied this today do. Uh, thank, thank you. you for your time. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Whalen. I hope you bring it to PNZ and it's a great project too. Because yeah. Thanks. I think it's a great project too. I hate gravel lots in the middle of a city. Yeah. I don't know what the project is. I, I, I'd like to know. Uh, so let's move on. Um, so that was the end of our right of way closures and uh, we are going to move on to unfinished business. The so first, we still have, we, we still have, uh, we still have the, the initiatives from the bike ped task force from the new business. Sorry about that, Randy. You're right. Uh, okay, so um, is the uh, actual bike and pedestrian task force had made some recommendations at their last meeting, which I was in attendance of. So is uh, so is Randy. And Randy, uh, do you want to um, do you want to walk us through this? Sure. So, um, <clears throat> speed is a speed is a huge issue and a huge contributor to injuries and to deaths. And so, I think it's actually you know I looked up what common knowledge definition was, and it said if you can cite more than five sources, it's common knowledge. So, I think it's common knowledge that the faster traffic's going, the more people are are injured and killed. Um, but just real quick, I noted uh, a 2011 study from AAA. Results show that average risk of severity of injury for a pedestrian struck by a vehicle reaches 10% at an impact of speed of 16 miles an hour, 25% at 23 miles an hour, 50% at 31 miles an hour, 75% at 39 miles an hour. Risks vary significantly by age. For example, the average risk of a severity of injury or death for a 70-year-old pedestrian struck by a car traveling at 25 miles an hour is similar to the risk for a 30-year-old pedestrian struck at 35 miles an hour. And then the last example I'll cite is from the World Health Organization. Speed has been identified as a key risk factor in road traffic injuries, influencing both the risk of the road crash as well as the severity of injuries that result from the crashes. The relationship between speed and injury severity is particularly critical for vulnerable road users, such as pedestrians and cyclists. For example, pedestrians have been shown to have a 90% chance of survival when struck by a car traveling at 30 kilometers, kilometers per hour or below, but less than 50% chance of surviving an impact at 45 kilometers per hour. Pedestrians have almost no chance of surviving an impact at 80 kilometers per hour. And so the Bike Pet Task Force is trying to figure out how we can better deal with speed problems in Asheville. And at our last meeting, we heard from the Asheville Police Department that they've upped their enforcement of speed issues, yet we continue to have speeding that's it's pervasive throughout uh, our community. And I think that's, again, common knowledge, it, and you can deny that. So in re response to that, Bike Pet Task Force has passed the following two motions. We would like the multimodal to pass these and then pass them on to City Council for implementation not saying specifically how they would be implemented, but just saying that they need to be implemented and to be tasked to staff to do that. The first motion is that um, we recommend the city of Asheville reduce their default speed limit from 35 miles per hour to 25 miles per hour. And that was unanimously passed. Right now, the state is 35 unless it's passed by the community or lower, and we'd like it to go to 25 miles per hour. The second one is we recommend that the city of Asheville install and use automated speed enforcement devices. And that also was passed unanimously. And we know that there's not gonna be an easy path forward with that one specifically, but we know there can be a path forward for it. And we don't think we should work out all the details at this point in time of how that would happen. We think just like reparation was passed by the city council for the African American community without an exact plan of how that would happen, just that that should happen. This should be the same thing. This is something that is in line with the, with the zero tolerance policy in terms of uh, you know, reducing no deaths, having no deaths on our roads because of um, traffic crashes. And we need to lower speed limits. And the city, like I said, the city police at our last meeting said that they can't do it. They're, it's out of their hands. They can write as many tickets as they want and they're not being um, as effective as what we need it to be. And so we need to do other things. And we think these are two 
things that might be working towards keeping our citizens safer. Thanks, Randy. So, I could vote. I would vote. Okay. Do we have any, uh, any feedback on this, guys? Um, yeah. Are you talking about enforcement mechanisms that automatically give you a ticket, or are you just talking about like a flashing sign that says, "Hey, you're going too fast"? Why does it give you a ticket? Heck yeah, I support that. I know that um, in some of our follow-up from the last meeting, I think we were notified that that's not currently. I know, Randy, you said that. Uh, you know, we're not going to hash out the details on how we're going to get this done, but um, I believe we are not uh, one of the chosen communities that are allowed to do that at this time. Um, so that it seemed like that maybe that's an uphill battle. Is there a way we can split these two? So I really like the idea of 35 to 25, and I'd like to, I wouldn't want anything to impede our ability to get that uh, moving as quickly as possible through this process, but also to uh, make sure that we're, we're you know addressing the secondary issue that might have some greater um, statewide implications. Yeah, so thank you, Dennis. There are two separate motions, so we can vote on each one separately. And you're right, we're not one of the chosen cities right now, but that shouldn't stop us. Those cities got chosen because they had someone advocating for them on the state level, and it happened. We could do the same thing. There's nothing holding us back from being able to be one of the chosen cities, except for us not trying to do it. So, but you're right, though, they are two separate yeah, motions. I wholeheartedly agree. And I'm okay, great. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree, and uh, I, I think I'm in support of everything. Yeah, Dennis, actually, if you um, look up uh, in North Carolina legislative law, there is a bill that was done. I think it's session law two, uh, 2000. It was done in 2003 or 2004. Any municip municipality can enact and adopt ordinances for the enforcement of traffic laws using photographic equipment. They just have to go through the process. And yeah, Asheville obviously gets the short end of the stick from Raleigh, but it's not that we can't do it. It just takes a little bit. Isn't it, it also a, a different funding kind of issue where changing traffic laws, traffic, traffic signs would be a lot less expensive than implementing the, um, the videos and things like that. The funds would probably come out of a, a highway DOT pockets rather than the city council. Again, we're not asking to to recommend how it happens. We're just recommending that it happens. I agree to split them into two two because it, they require such different um, tasks to achieve them. That I agree with it splitting it. Sure, and, and that was the intention to be in two separate ones, so two separate motions. So I can make the first motion first, and we can do the second motion. Sure. Yeah. So hey, the you, first, want, you want to go ahead and give us that motion on the first one? Yes. I have to find it again here. I'm sorry. So the first motion I'll make now as soon as it comes up. Uh, bicycle, the Bicycle Pedestrian Task Force makes a motion that the city reduce their default speed limit from 35 miles per hour to 25 miles per hour. Second. <laughs> The multimodal commission. Yeah, let's 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 clarify that, please, well, Randy. So, I think if I if I understand it correctly, our our task force and the commissions, transit and stuff can make a motion, right? Then we can approve that motion and they can pass it on to the city. Isn't that how it works? Well, let's just let's right. be a little clearer and say that we recommend that we pass because the bike pass force makes the, the, recommend the recommendations of the bike. Sure. So then I make the motion then as recommended by the bike pet task force to for the city of Asheville to reduce the default speed limit from 35 miles an hour to 25 miles an hour. I second that motion. I'll second that. Okay. So I think, uh, I think Patricia, I think Dennis beat you the punch on that one. Um, but <laughs> it sounds like we've got a, a, Motion and a, um, let's see to move along the um, the bike and pedestrian task force recommendation on to city council uh, on behalf of the multimodal commission to support that. Uh, 
to reduce uh, the city's default speed limit from 35 miles an hour to 25 miles per hour. So we've got a motion in a second and we'll go on to the roll call on that one. We'll start with Randy Warren. Aye. Okay. We've got Kenny Armstrong. Aye. Dennis Winsel. Aye. 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 Myself. Okay. Um, and then myself, Michael Stratton, I, um, the, uh, the ayes have it. The motion is passed. Um, okay, so let's move on to the, the second. Do I have a, a, a motion on that one, Randy? Sure. A motion, uh, as recommended by the Bike Fed Task Force, I recommend a motion to the Multimodal Transportation Commission that the city of Asheville install and use automated speed enforcement devices. Can I have a motion? Do I have a second? I'll second at this time. Okay, you got it. All right, so I have a, a motion and a second uh, that the Multimodal Commission um, recommend the recommendation that was made by the pedestrian, Bike and Pedestrian Task Force uh, that the city of Asheville install and use automated speed enforcement devices. So we're going to go on and do the uh, the roll call on that one. Uh, Randy Warren. Aye. Okay. Uh, can Aye. Armstrong. Aye. And uh, yeah, I would like to keep this on our future agenda list too to, to keep track of implementation. Okay. Absolutely. Dennis Winsel. Aye. Okay. Uh, Patricia Katz. Aye. And Michael Stratton, that's my, me, is aye. Uh, the motion's passed, and both of these motions will be, uh, be making their way up to city council. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's, that's big. Okay, um, looks like we are on to the, uh, the next bullet point, uh, which is to discuss the transit committee request to become a commission. Um, so a little on this, um, for those of you that don't know, the uh, transit committee, uh, which is currently a subcommittee of the multimodal commission, just like Greenways and Bike and Pedestrian Task Force. Um, it, previously, in previous years, it had actually been its mission um, and it reported directly to council and there wasn't a stopgap of the multimodal as a, uh, you know, in between. Um, so they were they were able to, to speak directly to council. Um, there has been um, some um, encouragement or some uh, an ask basically to get back to that, um, which I tend to uh, agree with. Uh, I, I, I like the idea. I mean, obviously, multimodal is is really part of uh, the the transit committee. Vice versa, we kind of have overlapping. Um, but um, at the same time, they are uh, they're they're a disproportionately large piece of the puzzle, um, and I do think it makes sense for for them to have direct access and more of a of a um, uh, more of a highlighted uh, position. But I, I'm interested to know what the rest of you guys think, or we need to have a discussion about this. Um, what what are y'all y'all's thoughts? Hey, Michael, uh, it's Dennis here. I, I tend to agree with you. I feel like when I'm going through, and I'm relatively new to the team, but I feel like when I'm going through this stuff, there's much more technical, um, you know, metrics trying to be met of its, you know, ridership numbers or, I um, mean, I was going through looking at, um, you know, um, PM receipts for bus work. Um, and I just wonder if that's, if, if there's somebody or a group that's probably a little bit more um, adept at providing that uh, that crystallized information to the city rather than us. I agree with that. Um, that it's with the huge budget, especially buses, that um, they 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 would be good at focusing for that own their own interest. I also agree with what's been said, and I like the fact of have of having 
transit represented on our committee to keep us in the loop with where they're trying to go so that we can still reinforce and encourage each other. Yeah, Patricia, one of the, the ideas that had come up as far as an idea that how this potentially could work if, if it was crafted would be that there would be some some um, some overlapping of, of membership on both uh, what would be. Uh, so ideally, you would have a voting member that's on transit commission also be a voting member on multimodal and then vice versa. Um, that way, you know, we're, we're, we're all covered, but I think that the thought process is, is that's such a huge piece of the puzzle that they don't get the, um, the time that they need in these meetings to, to really, uh, hammer out the, the, the many items that they need to hammer out. Because again, we've got, a, we've got uh, other things that are part of our purview that we need to hammer out. I totally agree. And I find that both modes of transportation need to interconnect, um, and support each other, but they are not going to necessarily use the same travel lanes. Um, I, I, I agree with, with, with your summary. So I, I don't know if today is, is, it, is the day that we want to actually vote on any recommendations, but what I would recommend would be that, you know, that we, we put a, a, a small task force or subcommittee together um, from members of this group that could liaise with, of the, the transit committee to design what we think would be a good approach, um, what would be the, the ideal scenario. And then uh, with the, the task force that we put together as well as the transit, um, is those two people, those two groups could come up with a plan and then we could discuss that at a, at a further meeting. Um, and I'd also like to give them the opportunity to to go ahead, I think at this point they're still without a uh, a chair, so I think that would be something that we would want to have in place before we we made any recommendations. Is just make sure that they had their their house in order as well. Yeah, I think that um, this transition is going to be if, if we do this it has to be done in a very orderly way and a legal way too, because they're going to have as an authority they'll have much more oversight control uh, over that organization than they do as a, as a committee. So um, there's actually, as being authority, I think they, you know, I, I had to look legally how it is, but I know like, you know, again, being in Chicago, the, the Chicago Transit Authority ran, you know, the CTA. It wasn't, it wasn't like run, it wasn't a group of volunteers that said, hey, we think these would be good for this. It'd be like, no, this is exactly how it's gonna happen because we're running the thing and the, and the staff administered that. So. It, it, we need to make sure that that's not the structure we have now at all. So we need to make sure that if we do a transition between the two, that transition is smooth so that the day that turns into authority, they're up and running and ready to go, not learning the ropes as they go along. Yeah, so I think part of that task force, Randy, would need to obviously include staff um, and perhaps legal as well, um, if staff didn't have the immediate questions. but. I think all hands on deck would need to be party to this so that when we do have recommendations, they're, they're, they're valid and they make sense. I think we need to clarify the difference between authority and commission. A commission yep. gives advice and an authority is, um, is able to enforce. Is that correct, Jessica? Um, yeah, I just, yeah, I kind of wanted to clarify too. My, my understanding of what the transit committee's request is, is to become a commission like your, like the multimodal commission. Um, so they would no longer be a, a, a subset, if you will, of the multimodal commission. And, and for all intents and purposes, the, the primary difference between the two is that, um, they would become an advisory body to the city council directly, just as the multimodal commission is as well. And that the city council would have to approve their them becoming a commission and a city council liaison would need to be appointed. Um, but that is a completely separate thing than a discussion about becoming a regional transportation authority. An authority is a government, um, it's a government, essentially it's a government mechanism for um, uh, um, providing a public service, whether it's 
you know, the, the regional transit authority or the, the sewerage district or such, there's, you know, that, that changes the structure of the governing, it, it has its own governing board and such. And so, um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if that, I'm not sure which one you guys are trying to determine right now. Or, well, you know, the supporting document. well, the supporting document actually says both. Right it now, says, I don't think we're uh, on the idea that we're going to set up a, some, like a work group on it. If at least that's, Randy is a. Yeah, Randy, we're talking about a commission, somebody that has a mission and wants to advise. We're not setting up a legal entity that would um, be a like like Jessica said, somebody that would be able to give orders and enforce them. That's not what we're we're looking for. More uh, a guidance that will have more time to dedicate to their interests. When with being with us, it's it's kind of getting um, third place and it has a lot of issues that we don't have the expertise on. Yeah, I think though the supporting documentation actually talks about it being an authority though and a commission. So I think that maybe that needs to be sorted out more too. It says transit spent 31 years as an authority and 17 years as a commission. So maybe, maybe, maybe we need to make sure our supporting document is more in line with what's, I like that in the resolution, it does say a commission though. So, um, we, I think that's one thing we need to kind of hash out, I think, too, in terms of what authority, if any, want this commission or whatever to have. Yeah, I think it's, it's philosophically, it's a, there's a difference, obviously, too, in terms of how it's run, if it's a commission or the authority, you know, too. So I guess it, need, it obviously needs to be hashed out more, for sure. But I'm, I'm in favor of moving forward to, to hashing it out. Okay. So d does anybody have really strong, you know, feelings that would, that would want to be on this work group? Um, I, I, I'd like to be involved with it. Um, I've, I've been following it as, as we've gone through this process, kind of in the background. So I, I mean, I'd like to be there, but I wouldn't like to be the sole person from this group. Maybe we can have another um, one or, or two folks and... And Jessica, obviously, would like to process to our liaise with, with the um, uh, transit committee. Yeah. Uh, Michael, I, I can help you. I can't devote a lot of time to it, but um, I don't think it's going to, I think what we just need to do is come up with a better proposal um, and maybe give a little bit more detail. Okay. That'd be great. Anybody else? Okay. Kenny? Well, I was just going to say, surely there's there's not a, I mean, I, I can't think of a downside of switching them from a committee to a commission, other than perhaps they might put forth a, a, a recommendation to council that conflicts with something out of our commission. But even so, I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing. But I guess the task force you're talking about is to figure out if there are cons as well as pros. Yeah, I think so. And, and really just to figure out what that structure would look like. And I, like I said, I think the ideal structure would have joint um, overlapping representation. That way, if there is some conflict, we, it, it can be hashed out, or at least there would be a voice from our and vice versa. Um, but yeah, um, uh, Pat, if you if you want to, to get with me, we can uh, discuss this after the fact, and then um, I'll, I'll get with Jessica too. Um, and then obviously we'll reach out to the folks uh, within transit that are making this request and uh, hopefully we can we can come up with a, a strategy that makes sense. I'll, I'll set, send you an email so that we can find a time to, to chat. Okay, well good. I know this was something that a lot of people have been wanting to see on the agenda for a while. So I'm glad we've had an opportunity to, to, to work on that. Um, so more to come everybody. Um, any any more thoughts on that before we move on? Okay, all right, good. Um, now let's go to unfinished business. So uh, at this point, we're going to uh, review the ridership information um, and make a recommendation on the UNCA late night uh, Friday Saturday service. Uh, I believe that's the N one. Uh, 
uh, that we had discussed. But um, a while back, I think it was the last meeting, we had said, let's put this on the back burner um, until we had a little bit more data about the ridership to decide whether or not this was something that we wanted to uh, continue on or, or, or not. So um, I think, Jessica, do you have an update for me? Um, sure. So in your agenda, there's a link to a memo that was produced by transit staff that summarizes the ridership information both for Fridays and Saturday nights, inbound and outbound, and by time of day. So um, when you look at the, the charts that have been provided, um, if you look kind of towards the right hand side of each of those charts as we get later into the evening, you can see that um, the ridership decreases um, significantly after about 7 or 8 p.m. Um, although, you know, I should say that the total ridership in general is not, is not um, you know, super high, but um, we're looking at between one and two people, zero to two people essentially um, on these inbound and outbound trips in the late night hours on the N1. And um, so we are um, recommending that we discontinue this service in the late night hours, um, at least for the this semester and if the university decides that they're also going to be doing virtual learning in um, the spring semester then we would recommend doing that as well and just to be clear jessica for for everybody's knowledge um this was this was a, a cut in funds from from the university and that's why this is even being discussed right Correct. They had reached out to us to say that they they would like to um, they would like for us to consider not providing the service because they are trying to find budget savings on their own. Um, I believe it's on it's around ten thousand dollars a semester. It's not a huge amount of money in the grand scheme of things for the transit budget. But you know we too are facing significant losses in transit from COVID, so um, that's that's why we're recommending to discontinue this rather than continue it and continue to pay for it out of our pocket versus UNCA's. Jessica, is, is the assumption that this is a, a temporary um, switch and that funding will resume? assuming you know the pandemic goes away at some point yes i think so i think that it's a service that unca values um i think that they just feel like it it's the usage is significantly less um they're not you know having any students on campus at this point granted there are probably others besides unc students that are using it but um the expense here definitely is vastly outweighs the, the ridership that we have um, in those late night hours on Fridays and Saturday evenings. Yeah, I agree. I, I was looking at the, the numbers and they, they do drop precipitously. And I think it, it's it's challenging, uh, you know, any day that we have to kind of constrict our service to our, our riders. But um, I think at this time, you know, it, with the, uh, Resources being as uh, as as scarce as they are, um, I think this makes um, really good sense. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the recommendation, or we make a recommendation to uh, suspend the N one service until further notice. I would I would just like to note, and I know it's in that report, Jessica. You know, definitely to to keep monitoring it. Um, you know, I think that's in the report to kind of check, obviously checking back with the UNCA as to what classes start, but to just monitor what happens um, so that it can get brought back. Because I agree with Dennis, it's it's sad to cut the service, but um, yeah, things have to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, and I think, you know, I have to agree with Dennis. It, it, it's our responsibility, I think, to be good students. 
um, that low. It, it it might not look that great if we if we decide to to keep it going or recommend that it keeps going. Um, so I'd I'd have to agree with that. But uh, so Dennis has got a a motion. Uh, do we have a do we have a second? And, and Dennis, can you go ahead and tell us one more time exactly what your, your motion was so we can we can get it right? Uh, sure. Uh, I move that we recommend uh, a suspension of the N1 service until uh, further notice. Can, can we add from N1, 9 p.m. N1 to 1 a.m.? Yeah. Sorry, yes. N1 late night service. And what was there, was there another, um, some other input? No, that's what I was saying to align with the staff recommendation, which is from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. Um, Sorry, begin, yes. And, and only until the next academic year, which which would be, I guess, August next year. Yeah, I like that part. Okay, yeah, I can support that. Uh, so suspend the N1 late night service until the next ac academic, the beginning of the next academic year. Second. I'm sorry, who's second? Sorry, that was like Kenny. Kenny. Okay, that was Kenny. Okay, so I've got a, um, a motion from Dennis uh, and a second from Kenny, I think that's what I just heard. Um, the motion is to recommend the suspension of the N1 late night service that's from the hours of 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. Um, at least until uh, or through the, the next academic uh, semester, until the next academic semester uh, upon, um, okay, so, uh, so we've got a motion in a second and we're gonna do the roll call at this point. Um, Randy Warren. Aye. Okay. Uh, let's see. Kenny Armstrong. Aye. Dennis Wenzel. Aye. Patricia Katz. Patricia, are you with us? Uh, um, and then myself, um, Vice Chair, you might have to take over. Sorry, hopefully Michael will get uh, back in line here. Uh, he, he's had to pop off on other meetings before and then come back in. But um, we... Uh, I think we had the whole vote, right? So we approved the, Patricia was the only one that we didn't have on there, approved the recommendation that the M1 late night service is suspended until the next academic uh, year. I think that was actually phrased twice, once the ac academic year and once the, ac the next academic semester. But uh, that's your proposal, your motion was the academic year, correct? Correct, ac academic year, not uh, January, but uh, August. Yeah, okay. All right, so, and then I see Lucy popped on. 
And Lucy's our next uh, uh, item on the agenda, an update on the Greenway, uh, the GAP plan. And um, I know Lucy's job has been made tremendously more difficult with the NCDOT funding problems. <laughs> so I just want to offer our sympathy to you for that, because I know that your everyday activities are much more difficult now than they had been. So thanks well, for joining us. I, I got some good news to share tonight, so I will um, get started right away. All right. So, uh, yeah, the first slide actually should address that. and. It is that the DOT has made funding available for the following Greenway projects, which are the French Broad River West Greenway. That's for construction. And uh, we will plan to put that out to bed this winter with construction beginning in the spring. And the Nasty Branch Greenway, formerly known as um, Town Branch Greenway, also has funding made available to us. And um, we will um, be in starting as soon as we can with invasive plant management um, and then construction will also begin in the spring and the north rad tip greenway funding this is not um, a hundred percent um, approved yet but it looks very favorable that the money for engineering and design will be available and once it is we'll release the request for letters of intent which is another fancy way of saying something like an rfq or, or rfp looking for consultants to do the work as soon as we know that the funding is place is in place So that's good news um, keeps rolling in. We're working very steadily on the gap plans. Um, the steps that we have already accomplished with our consultants are the review of our existing plans in the city of Asheville. Um, GIS base map creation has been finished. Greenway constructability analysis has been done sidewalk and ADA gap analysis is mostly finished and uh, we'll have a second slide to explain more but in July we did the ADA week and um, we had the introduction and SWAT which stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats meeting with internal departments and partners such as the DOT and the MPO. That ADA week I was just talking about was July 27th through the 31st. And um, just to recap, what we're trying to achieve with our ADA transition plan is not going to be a final um, product of a map that shows exactly where we're needing to improve ADA issues within our streets. Um, and other right away in Asheville, uh, because that would just be a huge, massive red blob. Instead, we're taking a different approach. And with our highly qualified consultant um, that is on our, our team, actually, she is in the process of stepping down because she took a job with the Federal Highways um, Department. Um, so she finished up her end of the work in late July. Um, our approach is to really take a look at uh, educating our city employees and eventually um, with that educating our developers in town on what is required and what is necessary to create appropriate ADA facilities. So we had meetings with the leadership of Asheville uh, talking about ADA obligations, meaning what we need to do so we won't be sued um, with the way that we build our facilities in the right-of-ways, the ADA transition plan element of the gap, and answering any of their questions. We had what was called the conundrum training, which was directly um, addressing issues with city staff who are, are responsible for design, build, inspection, and review of development proposals. And then we did the um, ADA training accessibility and work zones. So 
what access through work zones means and way, ways to achieve it so that we can stop the problem of sidewalks being blocked um, while things are under construction. And when I say we, I actually mean Barb Me. This, um, I was actually even on vacation that week. So Barb Me is our ADA specialist in on our staff and um, she and our consultants conducted this week's worth of very valuable training. She is, I believe, still on the meeting tonight. If you have any detailed questions for this, um, she'll be able to answer them. Our next steps with the GAP plan are um, reconnecting with our advisory groups. We essentially have two. One is outward facing, it's the citizen advisory committee. And the other is our what we're calling the think tank team, which is predominantly internal partners within various departments of the city, but also does include um, partners from the DOT and the MPO who work very closely with our internal partners. Uh, we thought before the pandemic that we would have met with these two groups um, probably once or twice by now, but just trying to get our footing in this new age of coronavirus. Um, it's taken us a while to get back in the swing of things and these meetings will most likely remain virtual through the rest of our planning process as it looks, out, looks at this point, but uh, we'll do our best to keep everyone engaged on these levels of partnerships as we move forward. Uh, the next step is evaluating priorities for pedestrian and accessibility plans. This has been ongoing and will continue to be, but um, we're, our interests are identifying priority destinations um, through the ADA lens and priority corridors. And then um, conferring with government performance lab at Harvard. We've um, been working with this group um, through our finance department, who is looking at ways to uh, improve equity issues through contracting. And the neighborhood sidewalk program that we do, another thing that really Barb Me is in charge of, um, was tapped to look at as an example of um, the type of work that Harvard can help municipalities improve. Um, and they chose it because it was already fairly well set up and um, the, the work has been really interesting. We are currently working with these Harvard um, lab people to coordinate with our consultants so that the work that we are already doing with um, prioritization through the equity lens will, um, I'm trying to figure out the best way to say it, but will simulate both efforts. Um, there's really very few differences in what uh, the Harvard lab group is trying to achieve and what we're already doing um, we probably have a more robust um, and heavy analysis through our consultants, but um, as far as contracts go, this will be a plus. Our online survey, uh, we are beginning, well, we're going to be launching it by the end of this week. Uh, we'll make sure that all of you have the links um, so that you can do them and also send them out to your networks. We'll have this uh, online survey open until the end of this year. We'll be um, kicking it off this weekend with a table event at Asheville on Bikes, um, Punk and Peddler, and we'll be on the corner of Emma Street and Craven Street, so that gravel lot near New Belgium. If you're riding in that ride, please stop by and say hello and take your picture and put it on Instagram. Um, we'll have the survey in English and Spanish 
and it's designed and tested for voice reader technology. We'll have a hard copy format that will be available for people who don't have access to the internet. Uh, the results will be analyzed to find areas where we're not getting feedback within the city of Asheville, both, you know, physically like neighborhoods, but also identified organizations or um, interest groups that we might not be hearing from so that we, the city staff, can make a more concerted effort to reach out to those people. Um, we're already... Um, making our steps towards veterans groups and other people with disabilities, neighborhood organizations, and whatever other group that we, that we can find through um, the holes in our online survey, we'll be reaching out to them. We are um, working on a photo campaign and that um, actually will be photos and videos. Um, we've had our first shoot. These are just three photos from that day. Um, and our goal is to provide some compelling photographs of people not only having fun on greenways, but also with um, the more complex problems that we see within our connectivity on sidewalks and ADA issues. So it's not all happy stories like these pictures show, but we'll hopefully give you a, a robust look at what we're trying to achieve through our Close the Gap plan. One of the parts of the Greenway Master Plan is what's called Asheville Unpaved, which will be a network of natural surface trails. And the city of Asheville it, right now is um, organizing and providing the room for this this work to occur, but if it's successful, the city of Asheville will be a partner of, a, of an alliance of partners, each working at their best strengths to create this system. And um, we will be working with partners such as Pisgah Sorba, which is a mountain bike group. It's one chapter of a national organization, Asheville on Bikes, Asheville Greenworks, Mountain True, um, Trail Sisters, 828 Running Club, uh, some of the breweries in town, et cetera, et cetera. I've got a longer list if you're really interested, but the point is that um, we're, we're working together with groups that are interested in seeing this happen and we'll be all doing what we do best um, to get uh, this, this set up as a framework with an annual work plan will know exactly what projects we'll be working on on a yearly level. Uh, before that annual work plan is signed, the group will have already done public engagement and project scoping and very clear on what kinds of permitting need to be done and what kind of costs the projects will incur so that the fundraising will be part of that annual work plan, if not before. And we'll have a very concrete and understood list of what projects will be done and who will be doing what in order to achieve those projects. And we're working in two realms. One is what we're calling hubs, which is essentially city-owned property, but also Partners such as UNCA and AB Tech have room on their campuses that have been identified as places that we can work on um, recreational mountain bike trails and multi-use trails for hiking and walking. <clears throat> so um, those hubs are one part of it, and the other part of it is what we're calling neighborhood connectors, which would be natural surface trails in neighborhoods that uh, have two very important things. One, a neighborhood organization that is aligned with one of our partners of Asheville Unpaved to sponsor the project and um, get it through the um, what will be an annual submittal uh, um, so that the group 
the Asheville Unpaved Alliance will be able to determine if it is a type of project that should go on an annual work plan. And secondly, that the area that we're talking about is on a piece of property where the property owner is willing to donate an easement so that the trail can go on their property without us needing to buy um, that easement. So we're currently working on a prioritization of hub projects right now um, that isn't 100% determined, but um, we need to have public engagement before we can finalize what those priorities will be. We're preparing to do that public engagement and we're looking at the policies and, and agreements that we'll need to have in place before we uh, are actually uh, ready to go live with the Asheville Unpaved idea. So just to make it extra confusing, um, in our bond, our transportation bond monies, we have a million dollars set aside for what is called neighborhood greenway connectors. And we have finished two projects, which we're calling the phase one of, um, of that spending. One is in the South Side neighborhood. It's called Elsie's Bridge. And it is called that because there is a bridge that um, crosses over Town Branch Creek right here, which is right next to um, the um, mountain housing opportunities complex of Glen Rock Hotels and the shop and condos next to it. And so um, this used to be a very heavily traveled goat path between Ralph Street and Depot Street, people from this neighborhood around Bartlett Arms and the South French Broad Avenue neighborhoods were walking or riding their bikes down this area over the bridge to get down to other neighborhoods down here and Mr. Green's grocery store. And it happens to be just a few steps away from what will be the trailhead of Nasty Branch Greenway. This is nearly complete. If you were to go down there now, um, you will see that um, we have the concrete eight foot wide pathway here. The bridge has um, been restored. And I don't mean that it needed a lot of work to be restored. It was actually um, by engineered standard in really good shape. We just needed to add a new layer of concrete on top of it. The only thing that's missing right now are the um, permanent handrails on the bridge. We have a temporary hand guardrail there now. Um, so if you go down there, it will look a little bit wonky on the bridge still, but it, it will be complete as soon as we are able to get that appropriate guardrail from the fencing company. Uh, this pathway needed to be a little bit serpentine because of the grade, but we'll be taking the opportunity working with the Office of Sustainability to um, place some community gardens in the curves of the path. There's a water spigot that's being installed now to be able to do that. The second project is the Reed Creek Extension, and it um, begins where Reed Creek formerly terminated at Magnolia Street and um, goes two blocks underneath the Chestnut Street Bridge. And um, this was an interesting project because we worked with the developer of this block where um, the Bob Lawrence power um, motor motor shop, I guess. Um, his, his buildings were here, but now there's a brand new multi-use, multi-storied building with apartments and shops. We worked with that developer on his parcel, which was essentially this block, and then built this block um, through our capital projects department. So this is our first truly greenway-oriented design, 
and uh, the developer was very happy once it was finished that it um, was something that looked so good on his property and what he's able to um, market his real estate as something on the Reed Creek Greenway. So we have about um, just shy of $600,000 left in that million dollar fund. And we're looking at two projects right now um, to move forward. And I would like to let you know about them and get your comments on them. The two projects are a um, Greenway connector in the Haw Creek neighborhood. And then the first phase of what is on our master plan called the Rhododendron Greenway. I hope you can see this map. Um, I can see it's a little pale. Um, however, this is um, a map that shows the location of the Arco Drive connector. Uh, there is a private property that is willing to give us uh, an easement along their creek front property here. And from that, we run into um, some city owned property. That. So we will continue the connector from this curve in Arco Road, which is a street that connects Tunnel Road to New Hawk Creek Road. And it's a fairly large part of the Hawk Creek neighborhood, but it's kind of cut off from the rest of the neighborhood. So this connector is a quick way for them to be able to get from their neighborhood to what we call downtown Hawk Creek, which is the barbecue joint and coffee shop on the corner of Beverly and New Hawk Creek Road. Um, we plan to have this as a natural surface trail. When it terminates on um, Beverly Road, it will be just uh, probably 25 feet from the entrance of the Hawk Creek Park, which has a trail system and a picnic pavilion in this area here. Uh, it will require either a pedestrian bridge or a culvert for an unnamed and very small water tributary that's roughly in this area here. Um, we're hoping um, that the calculations for stormwater will be in our favor so that we can put a culvert there. It's it's pretty small project for a really small water body and that will keep our costs really low. Oh, by the way, one other comment about the Arco Drive connector is that this would be what we'd like to consider a pilot project for uh, Asheville Unpaved, the the neighborhood connector idea of, of the Asheville Unpaved. And then the second project that we are considering now is uh, the first stage of the Rhododendron Greenway. The Rhododendron Greenway is on the other side of Shelburne Road from the Hominy Creek Greenway, which starts over here. Um, Shelburne Road, if anyone is familiar with this area, is um, a very fast car travel road here. Um, speed bumps were installed as part of, I think, part of our transportation bond project. I might be wrong about that. But um, that has helped a lot with the speed on Shelburne. But um, our intention will be to put a raised crosswalk with the flashing beacon here to allow people to um, cross Shelburne Road to get between the two greenway areas. Then there will be a sidewalk along Shelburne Road to connect up to um, a city-owned property where um, there is an old National Guard armory that is currently being used for um, fleet maintenance for P, um, Asheville Police Department and a garbage truck washing station and a couple of other uses, mostly storage for Public Works Department. It's a um, multi-acre facility. So our idea is to get up 
that there's a quite a steep grade change here, but um, get up to the um, armory property and cross cross the property just on the by skirting the um, the outside of the property and then um, making our way to Talmadge Road, which is a dead end street that ends right here. So our our project probably will stop here or will continue along Talmadge Road as a shared road facility and will then turn terminate at the West Asheville Park. The rhododendron greenway corridor does not terminate at this park. It actually continues past the park through a couple of subdivisions and other private properties and terminates at Sand Hill Road. And we have about 85% of the easements that we need to get from the park to Sand Hill Road, but we probably don't have the money to, to finish the entire corridor. So we will, um, hopefully, we, we don't have the money numbers yet, but we hope to have the funds to be able to make this connection from the trailhead of Hominy Creek Greenway up to Talmadge Road. And that is all that I have for our presentation today. If you have any questions, let me know. I can see about a hundred people bail <laughs> while we're here. But I will show you some of uh, the posters that we'll have. Um, let me see if I can find them. These are the posters that we'll be using um, starting this weekend at the Pumpkin Peddler. Um, this is, uh, I can't believe that we're going back to QR code technology, but this is a great way for people to be able to access our poll our survey with um, without needing to touch any screens. They'll be able to do this through their phone. And we will also have um, here's a celebrity from Multimodal Transportation Commission. We'll also um, have business cards with these QR codes so they'll be able to take them home with them. Hey, Lucy. Yeah. Is is the um, Natural Surface Trail Committee uh, looking at uh, ADA accessibility, or is this just a, an, an acknowledgement that this is a separate trail system altogether that you know cannot accept all 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 users? The, the accessibility is something that we are keeping in mind um, because these are trails, they'll be able to have a different standard, um, more of a trail accessibility standard, but we are looking at the ADA board's accessibility guidelines for trails and outdoor recreation. <laughs> Lucy, I have a follow up on that second greenway that you guys were were um, looking at there. Um, the uh, Hominy Creek um, one. I, I think that's great. You guys are connecting the, the those neighborhoods. But I was wondering, is there anything in the work to connect the southern portion that actually gets you down to the river? Um, I just know on, on some of my runs, it, it seems like uh, there's like that little piece of, of connectivity that's missing from the Brevard Road area that would actually get you transfer station to the um, the, uh, the the major greenway down there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that road, the transfer station road is called the Hominy Creek River Park Drive or something like that is not on our greenway master plan as a corridor yet. So when you do the survey, make sure that you say that you would like to see that. <laughs> Will do. That's another reason why we all need to share that across our networks. But thanks for the work that you guys are, are doing on all this stuff. It's awesome. I, I, hopefully we'll be seeing a, a huge um, Facebook and Instagram presence for the surveys. I'd like to make a motion that we rename the French Broad River West Greenway to the Lucy Crown Greenway. <laughs> I have to be dead for you to be able to do that, so uh, I'd rather not. <laughs> 
Well, well thanks so much for uh, uh, kind of recommendation for one or the other. Is it that we our budget really is going to allow one of these projects or the other of the projects and not both? We're considering both, and I'm hopeful that we'll have enough money to be able to finish both of these projects. Okay, great. I, mean, I, I the rhododendron is really enticing because I, I feel like it just it does connect uh, an area that I already used and I like the idea of extending it because we get that kind of uh, traffic that's uh, important for you know, the ongoing support uh, system. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I think that the Hawk Creek community is is angling for some greenways in their neighborhood though. So it, I really like that project, especially because it does tie into the park that's there. Um, and uh, there's a couple of big apartment complexes near the, the barbecue place. So I think that's a great way for them to access the park. Uh, and Lucy, just in general, these these neighborhood uh, greenway connector projects are really important. I know that we, you know, we always look at the, the, the really big eye catching projects, but um, these little connectors are really, really important. So uh, I applaud the focus on them. Thanks. Okay. Oh, well, thank you, Lucy. We really appreciate the update. Um, as always, thank you so much. Um, thank you. All right, folks, let's, uh, let's keep it moving. And um, let's see, where are we? We are... Uh, to our next action item, which is going to be general committee updates. Um, so transit committee, and Jessica, are you going to be filling us in on that? Or how's that one working? Um, if, if you don't mind, I, I don't know that we have any, let me see. I don't, I don't know that I have any major updates that aren't in the attached document. Um, although one, one thing I guess I could mention is that we will be going to council on the 10th of November, I believe, um, to add additional funds to the contract that we have with Young Transportation to, to continue to provide the su supplemental transit support buses and drivers for us. Um, we we have a contract with them that originally was for $962,000 and we have been spending that um, pretty rapidly and um, without additional funds being added to that contract, we would be running out of the, the funding by I think about maybe 12 to 13 weeks from now. So we need to um, get some additional funds in place. Um, at this, at this point, or I guess I should say at that point, November 10th or so, um, we will have about a million dollars of CARES Act funds left. And so what we're proposing is to take a little more than half of that remaining and add it to that young transportation contract. So that will buy us about 15 to 16 more weeks of, of service with them. Um, and, uh, and we'll have, you know, a half a million dollars left at that point. Um, and, you know, our, our feeling is that the CARES Act money is, is primarily intended to help get us through COVID and to provide service as best we can. And we certainly aren't it certainly is not perfect right now and people are continuing to be left behind, but we would be leaving a lot more people behind if um, we didn't have Young's help. And, um, you know, unfortunately that costs a lot of money and, it, and the money is going pretty quickly. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's quite likely, unfortunately, that we will, we will run out of CARES Act money um, before the end of this current fiscal year at the rate that we're spending it. And so, um, um, you know, I don't, the, the information that we're taking to council is we wanna add more money. It's possible that we'll be coming back to them and saying we wanna add everything that we have left of the CARES Act money back to the Young Transportation contract and we'll just keep using them as long as we have the money. Um, but, 
I, I have a feeling that at some point in like the early spring, we might be, we, we might be looking at, at not having the resources anymore. Um, we are, we, we have recently increased the capacity on the buses from 10 people, nine passengers, including the driver to 13 people plus the driver. And that was based on input that we got from drivers, from riders, from the transit committee um, and just economics and better buses together. It's kind of arbitrary. Um, there's not really a reason that we chose that number other than that it's we're trying to provide, we, we, it's, it's so horrible that we're leaving people behind. We wanna be able to fit another you know, a couple, two, three people on the buses if we can, um, but it's a balance and it's a risk. And so we're really trying to get people to wear masks. We can't deny service for someone that doesn't want to wear a mask, but we are trying so hard to get people to wear masks and um, Better Buses Together actually has hired some folks to help distribute masks at the transit station. And they also were able to get another 30,000 masks from the Dogwood Health Trust. So I think I think the city has purchased over 20, 25,000 masks and have handed out, I'm gonna say about half of that so far. They got another 30,000. And so um, they're out there pushing and trying to get people to wear those masks so that we can maybe get back to um, a higher capacity limit on the bus. There's no like rules of engagement for this really, you know, we're just trying to do the best we can um, and, and serve people the best we can. Yeah, well, it was great news that we were able to get, they were able to get some, some more masks uh, to distribute there. Um, I do have questions of, of, about that, but um, I think that's probably something I, I want to work with you on behind the scenes. Um, okay. As, as far as that's concerned, and maybe on the next agenda, we could, we could have legal explain to, to our group as well as the general public, you know, a little bit more about why it is that we can't mandate mask on the bus, but at the same time, we, we can mandate somebody to get off the bus if they have a, a drink in their hand. It just seems like a, some cognitive dissonance, but I understand that there's some there's some some legal rationale behind that, but I, I think uh, the public is probably owed, owed that answer in a little bit more thought out way, which we don't have time for now, but maybe on the next agenda, we can, we can get into that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, I just I just want to say real quick, Michael, thank you, Jessica, for all you guys are doing. Um, you know, I mean, I went through the numbers and I saw that, you know, there's still uh, whatever couple hundred people got missed and I, I hate it. <laughs> so, I yeah, whatever money, whatever ways we can find it, hopefully some of that saving off of the N1 late night service. I mean, that's going to save a little bit. I know it's not enough, but, you know, pushing and pulling. Is there any, I mean, I can't think of anybody other than Young in town. Have you guys explored, is there any other transit like around anywhere that would, or trying to negotiate with Young, like just somehow to know that it's probably going to be months more that, that we'll have to do this, you know? Yeah. Um, to your, to your first answer or your first question, I, we have, were not able to find anybody else. We, we did have some early communi communications with, um, and I might misremember the, the company, I think it's called Emma Transit Lines, and they, they have school buses that I think they use primarily for um, like field trips and recreation trips. And we asked them if they wanted to submit a bid for, for it, and they they were not in a position to, I think, for um, similar reasons that that we're struggling with staffing is that their drivers weren't interested in in doing it, kind of. Um, and and you know, I 
I, I had even reached out to the Biltmore, but it turns out that Young is who provides the transit transportation for the Biltmore from their parking lots. And, you know, I feel like we tried to overturn every stone we could. Um, we even were looking at using parks and rec vans to, to take one or two people, but um, that was going to be not workable because they ended up using theirs for like rec and roll programs. And so it's unfortunate. I mean, the, the bright side of it in one sense is that Young Transportation is a local company of 90 plus years and we are hoping them not go under, but it is extremely expensive. Um, so on your second question on negotiation, um, I, I feel pretty confident that what the price that they gave us is the best they could do. Um, Cause it's not just, you know, it's the, it's the bus, the driver, the insurance, the fuel, the maintenance, um, pretty much the whole package. And so in comparing that cost to what we pay for RATP dev service, it was very comparable. And, um, and, and I don't think they can go any lower than they're at right now. All right, thanks. Yeah, I just the, those kind of questions just pop up. And like I say, I'm sure you guys are thinking about all that. I just, yeah, it, we got to do what yeah, we got to do. I know. I know it's um, it's it's not a, a transit is not cheap, right? I mean, we our budget is over ten million dollars a year, and so having this private company help us too is is it's a very expensive proposition. Um, but I will tell you, I, I think that we are still maybe the only agency that is doing what we're doing. Most places have just cut cut routes, cut service completely. So I'm happy that we're able to do this right now. I'm thankful that we have the CARES Act money. I wish we could get more of it. Well, we appreciate you going to bat uh, at council to see if we can't get uh, a little bit more time um, You know, with the remaining funds hopefully um in 15 16 weeks congress will be able to uh, approve another um bill for local governments to to kind of get us through this um this thing yeah fingers crossed for sure um so jessica um is is that does that conclude your, your portion there okay yeah I right. think so um if, if you look at our um our project list spreadsheet thingy, it's been fully updated. I think we actually have the right information in there for the Biltmore McDowell study, Randy, hopefully. Um, so please take some time to check that out as well. Excellent. Uh, all right, guys, do we have anybody else that is going to be presenting on, on updates? I know that with bike and pedestrian task force, we kind of got, I think, the crux of what we wanted to get out uh, there for the sake of time. Um, I'd say let's let's let anybody else that's got something um, move forward. Is there anybody else that's reporting tonight, guys? Okay. Well, I know we had a lot of cancellations in some of our subcommittee meetings, which is unfortunate. But maybe next time we'll be able to get some some updates. Uh, PNZ is still moving forward, but there really isn't anything. Um, we did push, I guess the one biggest thing is over there on Cox Avenue, the, the new project at the old Wells Fargo Bank. Um, we are, I think the developer in the city finally did come to some agreement to actually do a 10 foot sidewalk there um, and, and essentially leave the existing sidewalk and add the piece on rather than completely rip out that absolutely usable sidewalk and do a new one. So um, there's been a few multimodal things that have come up, but they've been fairly minor. So, well, that sounds super reasonable. Glad to know that you guys can came up with a reasonable outcome on that. Um, okay, let's see. So staff updates. Uh, we've got on our list I-26 and then list of projects. Um, Jessica, where, where are we looking at? Um, nothing. Sorry, I I don't know. Um, I, I forgive me, but I didn't look to see if there was anything more recent than the June meeting of I twenty six. Um, I haven't heard anything from Ken about it. Um, I can touch base with him to see if there's anything additional 
um, that's more recent. And then the project list, as I mentioned, has been updated um, with recent information and statuses. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, then uh, I guess at this point, we're gonna be looking at future agenda items. Um, we, we've already discussed the transit committee becoming uh, a, a commission. We talked about that a little bit today. Um, so we're gonna push forward with the idea that we're gonna get a subgroup go, going between Jessica, myself, and Patricia. We'll also need to figure out who we're gonna be communicating with uh, on transit committee. Um, and then hopefully we can we can review a few of these items and then get back to, to this commission with a, a better game plan to review uh, next go around. Um, we still have uh, the, on that same kind of type of vein, uh, Stacy seat becoming um, a, a seat on MMP. PC. That's something else we'll want. Um, traffic calming programs. Uh, we talked a little bit about that today, but um, I think that's that's something we we want to have more of a an in depth conversation about. Uh, again, guys, any of these things, whether they're on this list or they're not. Um, let me know, and before our next um, uh, agenda setting meeting, we can decide what, which of these go on there. So uh, the more proactive you guys are, the better this is for our, for the uh, commission and the, the greater public as far as our conversations are concerned. Um, county transit opportunities, right-of-way closures, process discussion. Again, today we went through some of that, but it would be good that we really kind of flesh that out as far as what, what it is we want to to see with that. Um, Greenway easement policy and review um, with, Lu with Lucy um, paratransit uh, requirements related to the city's bus service. Um, another one that has come up that's that's not on here um, that might be something we want to talk about is just the timing of this meeting. Uh, might be a good idea to decide it, is, this, is this a good time? Um, Three o'clock in the afternoon, is it is it equitable? So consider that too. Um, as far as public comment, uh, what do, it's, do we have public comment that's live on this one? I, I don't think we, we do, but um, I think in this format, we, we do take recorded public comment and or written public comment. So if we've got any of that, um, I'll ask staff, do we have that? We do not. Okay. All right, that's, that's unfortunate. I, I really look forward to those days where we go back to, to live meetings, uh, just for, for that specific um, point right there. Um, okay, the uh, the next meeting of, um, of the MMTC, uh, it's TVD listed here. Um, usually we, we have, uh, we kind of move it depending on what the holidays look like. Um, is that something we want to discuss now, Jessica, or are we gonna, um, talk behind the scenes and get back to everybody. Um, that's up to you, Michael. My, my recommendation would be to try to have a, I'll call it a November slash December meeting, the, either the first or second week of December. It doesn't necessarily have to be on a Wednesday. So what we could do is um, do a doodle poll and see when people are available. And then we'll just have to, um, check that against what the city staff, behind the scenes city staff availability is too, and make sure that we have the proper staff uh, resources available. Okay, so it sounds like there's a few unknowns. Um, so let's let's go with with that that idea of uh, doodle poll. Uh, I do like the, the idea of, of doing it after Thanksgiving before Christmas, that first couple of weeks of December. Um, so yeah, let's, let's make that, that poll happen. Okay. Um, okay, guys. Well, uh, it's a long meeting. We've got a lot in. Uh, I really appreciate everybody's time. Um, thank you to staff. Thanks to the commission members. Thank you to the public uh, for hanging in there. Um, we did important work today, so thank you. Meeting thank adjourned. You. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Cheers.